Good afternoon, dear friends. It's such a pleasure to have you, and in particular to have so many people here in the room. I know people are going to start joining us online shortly. We are opening our conference, Art and Science, the Art of Talking to the Other. Now, you probably know that science art is actually more than art, and it's more than just a cultural phenomenon. In fact, it's a very special and a very powerful tool for interaction between different communities and, shall I say, institutions. In fact, Laboratoria Art and Science has actually been promoting and facilitating this kind of collaboration, which is a very ambitious undertaking. I'm often asked what has changed over these 13 years that we've been working together with scientists and artists. Over this time, we've actually developed a series of methodologies which help us achieve a productive collaboration between different communities. Today, in part three, we are going to discuss in detail how we bring together diverse communities, what kind of you know tricks we have in our sleeve or up our sleeve. In fact, technologies have changed dramatically over the, this past 13 years. You know, Laboratoria was established 13 years ago with the mission of creating a platform where scientists, engineers, and artists could collaborate. What's interesting is that 15 years ago, when I first went into the field of science art, science art was actually considered a very new and, well, frankly speaking, quite unusual field for many experts, even in the field. Now, it has obviously changed since then, and we now have lots of uh, BA and MA programs in science arts. Currently, there are four being offered across the country, but actually I know for a fact that many more will be available soon because we are approached by numerous universities who want us to consult them on the subject. In fact, lots of uh, similar centers, shall I say, interdisciplinary centers around the world are doing this and well we are very much in well, working hand in hand with them you know quite often they bring together not just institutes not just universities but also factories and plants and what have you in fact we see this great need in interdisciplinary dialogue around the world now i heard for example that i think it is a Princeton that they actually invite philosophers to the Department of Biology in order to make their discussions more interesting and more profound. So it's a very important trend we are going to discuss today. We're going to reflect on non-anthropocentric way of seeing the world and through the lens of uh, our exhibition, which I hope you've checked out already and maybe you've done it more than once. So it's obviously called Let of Me, the Other Live in Me. It's actually a very popular exhibition. Now, you probably know that, you know, in the, in the world of museums, people are often unsure if it's good to have so many visitors. Actually, we are being asked now to extend this exhibition, which is actually pretty difficult because the tree obviously wants to go back to the earth, so to speak, and you know, uh, lots of uh, technical elements, lots of hardware pieces were not designed to last this long. For example, we've got a piston in one of the installations, which actually has had to be replaced several times already. Also, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank our partners. Uh, obviously, many of our discussions here are going to revolve around the exhibition. So I need to start by thanking a bunch of our partners. We have a strategic partner that is Kaspersky Labs. We have been collaborating with them for years. It's not just this exhibition that they've supported. Actually, it's uh, just one in a series. And we are happy to actually be thinking about the modernity with Kaspersky Labs. Naturally, I want to thank the Tratikov Gallery, which hosts this event, and my gallery. Now, you probably know that this summer, 
we actually opened officially here in this new space in the traffic of gallery or rather the new building of the traffic of gallery we actually have very ambitious plans and we are uh, very grateful to the whole team and to Zelfira Trigulova personally we believe it is great that technological art is now available in such an important institution for the whole country naturally the conference this time is a very important proof of the same also i want to thank cultural centers and embassies and goethe institute and uh institute Frances, uh, under the aegis of uh, the uh, russian embassy of uh, the french uh, republic and also the embassy of slovenia actually artists are going to represent all these countries today now i should probably tell you a few words about the exhibition and i am aware that we're slightly behind our schedule i'm sorry probably people don't even know who i am right so it should be there should be a banner or something telling you who i am but instead we actually have the art and science thing which is good I'm sorry, I, I should have actually introduced myself myself because I thought, you know, you were able to read it. So I'm the founder of Laboratory Art and Science Foundation. I'm the curator of the May the Other Live in Me exhibition. And, uh, well, I'm also the curator of uh, the exhibition. Oh, sorry, I said that. And I'm also uh, one of the organizers of this event. So we are going to discuss Hmm, somebody's checking sound apparently so it's very important for us to discuss together with the artists and the scientists what we have achieved so far because naturally all of us live in our own bubbles and therefore we can benefit greatly from the others feedback so to speak we may benefit greatly from learning you know how what we do can actually you know be seen or can help other people i first conceived of this exhibition back in 2018 obviously well before the pandemic but quite surprisingly you know the main hypothesis of this exhibition was proven in the time of the pandemic when it was so clearly shown to us that you know whole states and multinational companies ground to a halt and we realized back then quite painfully some of us that it's impossible to control everything so this exhibition is actually helping us look at alternative communication strategies not just communication strategies with the like plants or animals that we quite often communicate with but the not so usual others such as bacteria or insects or artificial intelligence maybe you guys also know that right now the biennale in venice is actually touching upon the same subject of interspecies communication I do believe, or at least it appears that, you know, many people who attend the exhibition, they seem to like it, but they still have this question, isn't it a bit too weird? Isn't it a bit too over the board? Is it really okay to allow a bacteria inside yourself? Or what Art Orient Objet did, you know, mixing your blood with that of a horse this does shock quite a lot of people but you know what science art was quite unusual for this country 15 years ago and i believe that we are seeing this kind of interspecies communication as very weird indeed but maybe five or ten years down the road it will change now let me tell you what you should expect from the conference today the conference consists of three sections. Each section will include online and offline speakers. Obviously, they will all make presentations and speeches about 10 or 15 minutes long. And after that, 
moderators are going to hold q a sessions and we are going to give you guys an opportunity to ask your questions here but if you're actually watching us online please try to submit your questions as well we'll try to make sure that your questions actually get asked and by the way we are interpreting the whole thing we will have presentations in both english and russian we have a very good interpreter with us name is uh, dimitri he's uh oh it will be pretty difficult for the interpreter to live up to that promise but well he'll do his best and we are going to discuss in the first section we are going to discuss the boundaries of the human what makes us human and what is changing in or rather at the boundaries between the human the animal and the machine in the second session we'll try to learn in a non-anthropocentric way mostly in this session you will see philosophers and artists and naturally i'm going to introduce all the panelists so to speak of the first session is very shortly but the third one and please bear with me for just a second. It will be the experience of new community dialogue. I will actually moderate this session. And in session number three, we shall hear from practitioners who both in Russia and abroad take care of these frontier processes, bringing together diverse communities. Interestingly, they have you know very different communities. Now, my community is that of artists and engineers, while for other people, these communities could be communities of bacteria or communities of animals. So we will discuss all of this. And naturally, we have lots of very practical examples. So this is the first session, and I'm happy to invite the speakers for the first session to go onto the stage if they are present offline. This is Yekaterina Nikitina. Actually, if you can give the hand to the people I'm inviting here. So Yekaterina Nikita is a PhD researcher in animal studies. And she is associated with a post-human studies lab. Next, we have Alexander Gostov. And he is, uh, well, a long-time expert and consultant of numerous exhibitions we have. And also in the room, we have Yelena Brisgalina, PhD, and she's the head of uh, the philosophy of education um, group at uh, the philosophy department of Moscow State University. And also we have uh, connecting online, Marion laval Jante, who is an artist and a participant of our exhibition. I understand she is being connected right now. And uh, she is also the founder of Art Oriente Objet. Actually, I should probably tell you something about Marianne. So in the exhibition, you actually saw her piece which, uh, with the name which correlates very much with the name of the exhibition, Me, the horse leaving me. Actually, it is you know, one of those pieces which stimulated me to produce this exhibition. And I was inspired by this particular name. So Marian is with us today. Hello, Marian. Hi, nice to meet you, nice to be here. Very happy. And uh, I'm about to hand over to you, Lena. Yes, thank you very much for introducing us and indeed we will be talking about humans as uh, techno biological objects and you've been saying objects and subjects which is good we are actually going to use the exhibition and ideas of artists as as the stepping stone to a discussion of what it is like to be surrounded by other entities and what it's like, you know, when they are inside us or we are inside them, when, you know, the boundaries between us and them start blurring. I think the key objective here is not just to have, a, you know, a dialogue between communities, but it's also an invitation to each of us empowered 
with science and art to reflect on what it is like to be a human being today. Is there anything else we can decide, we can discover in ourselves with the help of science and art? We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers. Uh, Marian, my first question should go to you. I have, you know, to uh, spill the beans here. I actually read a lecture to my students earlier today, and I did mention science art. And my students will be working on your project. They've taken it as homework. They have not submitted uh, their works yet, so it's difficult for me to make any predictions. But it is an unbelievable coincidence, I think. So, Marion, can you please help my students, or possibly all of us, by telling us what it means to you to be human and to be a horse? Thank you. <laughs> well, um, this is this is a good question. Um, I must say that first of all, um, to, to answer that, I must say that in the art we are doing, Benoit Mangin and myself, uh, there is a strong involvement, um, especially about auto experimentation which is not um, obvious for everyone. I mean, for us, it's very important to have that auto-experimentation to be able to produce specific artworks. So um, being a human, <laughs> I must say scientifically speaking for me is uh, in, in with zoological uh, terms is first being a human primate. Um, when I studied um, uh, ethology very much, especially in Japan, in, uh, with Benoit, we went in the Inuyama um, Primatology uh, Center, which, the, which is the oldest one in, in the world. We have first discovered that we were uh, mainly uh, primate, human primate, but primate. That means that the, so the sociological uh, activities we have, the links we have between us, are very, very much uh, inspired by this um, major family, which is primate. And for us, um, the question is how to be more than that, or how to understand ourselves by um, meeting some other species. Uh, this was a, a very um, strange way to, <laughs> to, to, to start. Uh, maybe I could share, uh, um, I don't know if, if it's possible to share um, an image. I uh, will try to, where is it? I don't know, maybe not. Uh, well, first we have, uh, we have been in other culture before being study in, uh, studying um, art biotechnologies uh, Links. The first thing we did was, for example, to be to be going to the pygmies initiation in Africa, and find what was our animal totems, which because it it exists in all that kind of um, uh, so societies, uh, the connection between human and nature through the forces of the and the entities of the forest. And so we discovered first, we, we were different animals. So Benoit was a bird, I was a primate. It was very interesting to see that between other culture, uh, being able to contact um, traditional uh, entities of the forest, we were not human at all. Then we, we were wondering, okay, we had this experiment, but this is a very inner neurologic, psychologic, mythologic experiment. What would be to have a real experiment of being a non-human or maybe understanding the human we are by experimenting a non-human being inside our bodies? And so we started studying. First, we were supposed to um, maybe try it with being a panda. And it was 
a very nice idea because we thought then we would we would even be um, having in our bodies uh, panda cells, which means disappearing animals uh, would be living in human animals, which was for us also a very important thing in terms of politics. And maybe we would we were all the more fascinated that panda is an animal that was first um, uh, eating meat and became vegetarian, and it has also a thumb like the human. So we were very fascinating in feeling another way, uh, an evolution that, that is quite different than, than ours, and see if it was possible. Uh, it was not possible to do it with the panda, so we worked on the, on the horse because there were lots of um, uh, medicine um, laboratories, medical laboratories working with the horse. So we, we did the experiment with the horse. And we didn't know if it would work. I mean, we knew that immunologically speaking, people were working with um, horse uh, uh, immuno immunology, especially the immunoglobulins, cytokines, alarmins, all the proteins that are uh, kind of um, vehicles in our bodies to the different organs giving information and changing your metabolism. And actually, when we discussed with those laboratories, they didn't know. I mean, they were trying to um, different to test different immunoglobulins for different kinds of sickness, like people who were lacking um, neurotransmitters. So they were trying to use um, horse neurotransmitters, immunoglobulin so that they would enhance the, the metabolism of the human. But they never did something like using them all together. <laughs> and, and they were not very much for that kind of self-experimentation because they, th they thought it was quite dangerous since they didn't know what would have happened if we, if we had them all together. And, um, and they were afraid, of, of course, of... Um, um, anaph uh, anaphylactic shocks or something that would be a strong allergy of the body. So we, we, um, we still wanted to do the experiment. And so we, we took two years to do it. And in fact, for two years, I was very um, caring about the, the way I was eating, the way I was drinking, no, no alcohol, nothing in my uh, diet was supposed to be inflammatory. So, so it's, it's quite a provoking inflammation. So, so it was um, quite long work. And, and at the end, yes, I tried to have that uh, shot of um, horse cells, blood cells in my, in my body. And, and I must say it's a very interesting experiment um, it's a very interesting experiment to understand who we are as human, because suddenly what happened to my body was not really human anymore. I mean, I was a human still, but my, human, my, my humanity was uh, hybridized with horse um, reactions. Like I could not sleep like a human. I was uh, having a very uh, cut um, sleeping like the horse. And um, I felt very strange feelings, like being very uh, fearing, but not like the human uh, experiment fear, more like a kind of um, very superficial and reactive fear. And at the same time, I was feeling very um, powerful because, of course, the immunoglobulin of the horse are more than, they are exactly 180% of the human immunoglobulins. That means that they are very strange vectors in the biological system. They are, they are giving information that are too big for the, the human cells to receive. So we have to adapt. I mean, the, the body is immediately trying to adapt to that very strange vectors that it meets and it overreacts exactly the way a horse would overreact. Um, and so it's, it's very strange. I mean, I felt very powerful, very fiery, sleeping a, a strange way. So I didn't feel any more exactly like the human I was supposed to be before. 
And I thought this, this was very interesting. For me, I think being a human, most of all is being able to have those experiments going on in my life, meaning it can go very far away. It could be like trying to die with a pygmy and see if there is something behind the body or having this um, horse shot and see if something is, is moving in my body, changing the way I, I see uh, the others and especially the horse, which is an animal I was not spe specifically familiar to. It's, it's an animal which is quite foreign to me. So, so it's, um, it, it was very interesting to have this um, combination of, of not knowing especially the animal and starting feeling it in, in my body. And, and be, be behind that, after we worked a lot on the microbiota, we, we made, for example, cartography of the microbiota we had, uh, discovering that all the places we have been on Earth um, were present in our body through different microbes, uh, bacteria, different taxons. And it was very, very fascinating to me because the more we were traveling, the more we were also changing our minds. I mean, we were not exactly the same uh, after traveling than at the start when we were young people. And it was not only olding, getting old, it was also being more and more complex in terms of, um, of biology. So for us, I think, um, being a human for us is very much like experimenting our bodies um, and, and our consciousness um, together. I mean, if it, if it was just having that, that body and using it without caring about what it can give to us, I think it would be um, a big lack. And there is one question very interesting that Irina asked me is, um, can we survive, for example, in a techno world? <laughs> I think it's, it's a very interesting question considering this experiment. Because in some ways, uh, me and Benoit, we are always feeling it's very difficult to survive in that techno world in the sense that we don't have the kind of experiment that we are used to have when we walk in forest, when we, when we uh, cultivate when we meet animals, when we uh, jump, um, swim, or whatever, all the experiment we we would uh, we would have with our bodies, for example, in if we were living in the rainforest like we were with the pygmies. Um, so, so this is something that is a very a very big lack for us. But at the same time, because of this techno world. We can experiment things that we were not able to experiment before. You must know, for example, that I think the first Nobel Prize in, in the start of the 20th was about vaccination in medicine. It was the Nobel Prize of medicine of 1905. And, and it was about vaccination and vaccinating people with horse blood. And um, it was von Bering, it was a German. Uh, doctor who tried this, this uh, experiment. Uh, unfortunately, I think he killed most of his patient <laughs> trying this. But since it was a very big um, uh, step in science, he still received the Nobel Prize because it, it was very important to imagine that that vaccination would exist. So in, in one uh, century, we could obtain of course, vaccination and all that, but also we could address the body with uh, compatibilizing, it's difficult to translate, I suppose. I mean, making different biology com com compatible through um, science and scientific experiment. For example, we, we, we didn't take every, uh, immunoglobulin of the horse, we had, for example, to, um, to check and, and take away 
the one that it, that was concerning the herd, because we knew that the herd immunoglobulin of a horse would not work on a woman uh, herd. We did an art piece like that in which you can see a big herd, which is the herd of the horse, um, real size, and the small herd of the woman just beside, and they are connected with. Um, uh, glass, uh, glass pipes, and and you can see it looks like impossible. And this is this impossibility that we build as an artwork uh, to show that this is the only immunoglobulin we had to take away because it was really too dangerous. But um, only the science could make us um, make these sharings between the immunoglobulins. And I think what was very interesting in terms of experiment is that. Of course, we could not have done it without the actual science advances. So both uh, science could be seen as something quite terrifying in terms of um, experimenta experimentation uh, for people, but it could also enhance this, this possibility of our bodies, which would enhance uh, necessarily possibilities of our, our mind. And I think that is, that is the most interesting. I must say that at the time we did this experiment, there was a very interesting book of um, Rollins. I think it's Mark Rollins, which is the philosopher and the wolf, where um, he described the way he has lived for um, a wolf life, that means um, 20 years, more than 20 years, with a wolf. He didn't expect to have a wolf first, but it happens to him. And, and it was not a, a domestic animal, and it was not reacting a human way. But he had to be himself understanding the wolf living next to him. And the wolf had to consider him as a kind of wolf. And this kind of sharing um, is something that people are questioning more and more. I mean, how can we just cut uh, those boundaries we build, destroy them so that we can understand more the other kind of life we have? And this guy explained in his book how he understood he was a human just comparing himself to the wolf. And he said that sometimes he would prefer to be a wolf <laughs> because he... he he believed that their, their loyalty and, and their strength and so on is bigger than the human one. But this is very interesting because I think at the start, we were all thinking that this uh, experiment uh, would, be, would be in some ways very proximate from the one of Roland. That means being someone else than we were as human. So I don't think... Um, I don't know how much, how many um, time uh, last. What I can say is that we went quite far away in those experiments. For example, uh, recently, a few years after the horse, I made an experiment called May the Rainforest Live in Me, which was about um, getting the microbiota of um, a friend who was a pygmy in my body. And at the start, everyone thought, you are crazy, because this kind of uh, sharing uh, might be endangering. And in fact, my body changed a lot when I got that microbiota. But this extreme experiment made me understand what was going right or wrong in this body. And from an art experiment, it became kind of conscious experiment, awareness experiment about the world. And it made me even understand how I could cure myself better. And from this experiment, I could also understand how to cure different people and, and how to have a very large uh, scale of work from the micro, uh, from, from the microbiome to the, to the um, real size and to the environmental size. And, and I think it's very important for artists not to uh, forget that the human um, situation in this world 
is really um, something linked to the environmental from the very little size to the large size of the planet, even over the planet. And, and if you don't realize your place just in this link, um, I think uh, you're not a human in some ways. I think being a human is just to realize your, your place in that whole environment and when you can, what you can do as a human to, to try to survive in it. Because actually the attitude we have is, is endangering uh, our species very much. And so the more you make experiment on your body and, and on science, the more you understand your, your place and what you can do with it. So I think maybe the best next would be to, to discuss with people uh, in, in, in the next uh, um, table. Irina, I don't know what you think. Mayon, thank you so much, Marianne, for you know such such an honest answer. Now you've said that being human means to experiment, it means to risk in order to understand oneself, in order to discover one's boundaries. And here you've touched upon a subject which is very dear to me. That's the ethics of experimentation. Well, because you know some experimenters only look at what's legal but there are additional ethical constraints and here i would like to invite alexander to continue this discussion so alexander is doing research into cyber espionage cyber weapons and cyber attacks you know to many people being human means being protected against you know, any attack on one's privacy. And there is a project by Dania Vasilev at the exhibition, which I understand was supported by yourself and your company. So my question to you is like this. What kind of thinking should your project stimulate? And what does being autonomous mean in a digital world? You know what? I think it would be best for me to start this discussion with a story. Obviously, we all live digital footprints, and this has been the case for many years. Even some 20 years ago, when I, for example, first turned to the world of cybersecurity, well, even back then, people actually had to make efforts in order for information about them to be available on the internet. Like in 2021, you can easily search a person by his or her name and find a treasure trove of information. But 20 years ago, people would create home pages to shout to the world that they exist and they do this. So this process of creating you know, their virtual twins or virtual ambassadors was fully under control of the authors. However, that was before the advance of social media. When social media appeared, they gave a much easier opportunity or a much easier way of populating the internet with information about you, which means that digital twins became easier to create. But that was only the second stage. The third one is nigh, or is already here, in fact. Now, we can no longer control what's happening to our digital twin. Our digital twin evolves without our oversight. There are systems out there which keep creating or rather keep updating our digital image. And this digital image is no longer a twin. It's in fact different from what we consider the real us. You know, Dania Vasilyev's piece shows that this data often 
is generated by, for example, intercepting video conferences. And many of us actually spent the previous year in video conferences. So you can easily, you know, talk to some people in a chat for a short period of time, but there, there is an artificial intelligence out there analyzing your digital footprints, trying to make some conclusions about you, like your gender, your age, your mood. All this is being collected. All this is being accumulated. Well, naturally, this data is not very precise. How come? Well, because computers also make mistakes. You know, sometimes software will look at your image and will get your age wrong. We'll think you're 20 when you're 40 or the other way around. And this digital image of yours can therefore be faulty. However, and quite unfortunately, it is usually these digital twins which get created without much of input from us. Lots of other systems will be making lots of decisions which will impact your life. For example, many of us are being bombarded now with uh, irrelevant advertising online. Although there was a time when we were exposed to lots of irrelevant advertising. Like, how do you do it in real life? For example, if a bank starts offering you loans based on their impressions of who you are, I'm sorry, of who you are, they may easily be operating on the basis of erroneous data. So it's obviously a problem which can easily become critical. In the future, states will probably use the same data collected over decades, erroneous as it is, in order to make decisions which are going to impact our lives. Now, I think everybody knows about the social rating system in China, where everybody has got a sort of a digital dossier, a digital score reflecting, you know, how good you are. And if, for example, in social media, you say bad things about the government, your digital score drops. And by the way, this information will also become available to the employers, as well as uh, real estate owners or uh, um, lessors, which means that this digital school, in essence, may easily become more important than a personality because it has a bigger impact on the person's life. Effectively, we will need to find a way to coexist, to come to terms with this digital personality. And the options are not numerous. For example, we can choose to stick to this digital twin. Even if it is wrong, it is simply, it can be at least, simply easier to live up to this digital twin. Or alternatively, you may try to sculpt this digital twin proactively, which is the right option if you ask me. In order to do that, you will need to know where data about you is being stored, how it's being used, and so on. If you know all this, you may have better opportunities in terms of sculpting your digital image. The third option, and the previous two are living up to it, impacting it, and the third option is actually trying to get rid of electronic communications wholesale, completely, which is not feasible for the majority of people. But we are seeing people like this. Actually, the number is growing. People who, you know, delete their accounts on social media, 
and they try to minimize their usage of the internet, claiming that this is sort of a, the eye of Sauron. So the work by Dania Vasiliev is a way of accentuating, emphasizing this problem, shown it slightly differently. Now, when we're exposed to technologies, our perception or our information is actually shaped by several sources. One is mass media, and very often what you read in mass media, in media, is just rewarded press releases. Or alternatively, it can be reviews by people who have used uh, the same technologies. And now we often call these people influencers which is a helpful reminder because sometimes they are not really telling us the whole truth and they may be biased. So we are offering here a, third, a, a sort of a third opinion, a look at technology from the viewpoint of art. So let me repeat here that the piece by Daniel Vasiliev is there to invite people who previously were not aware of this issue to start thinking that these digital twins are not real twins. They are an abstract image. If you like a shadow, which may easily hijack our life. So we certainly don't want to be enslaved by them. Wow, that's interesting. And you've just given us a different answer to the question what it means to be human. According to you, being human means understanding that there are actually different types of identity and having agency to actually choose a personality out of the full list which actually meets your needs in the best way so it sort of sounds like you do not endorse the idea of letting go of our biological bodies in view of digital avatars well indeed uh, when we're talking about pretty distant future so this idea does get mentioned quite often, particularly in the context of digital deathlessness or digital eternal life. So indeed, you know, AI like this can actually continue to live on, sort of impersonating quite convincingly a long dead person. Well, you can argue that avatars capable of consciousness and cognition can persist, can live on online. Well, we are going there for sure. I mean, uh, the internet is quite good at supporting the stuff which is already dead. I actually believe that moving totally to this digital world will be very scary to some people well there should also be people who would be very happy that there is this opportunity to live on alexander thank you very much for this segue to yekaterina's subject of mortality because being human certainly means being mortal yekaterina the floor is yours. We'll probably need some help with the presentation here. So, this um, issues of mortality, the beautiful and the ugly. Yes, in my presentation, I'll simply be listing some key ideas I will be dancing about in my speech.
Помогите нам, пожалуйста. We need help. Okay. Human animal prosthesis. Three statements about the human. Indeed, I'm going to focus here on three ideas of uh, the humanity, so to speak. And these are the questions that researchers often ask each other when they're trying to determine what a human is. And usually we can trust humans with animals or humans with the inanimate. So uh, Jacques Derrida uh, actually uh, wrote uh, this particular work, The Ends of Human, I think is the name, back in 1968. And I actually think it's, it's a great quote because it does rhyme with our international conference. So the question of who we are is obviously a very universal question. And the situation is actually quite absurd, according to Derrida. Back in the 1950s, he said that the number of uh, such uh, workshops keeps uh, growing. We keep asking ourselves who humans are. And at the same time, internationality makes it impossible for us to answer this question because it's ultimately a matter of conventionality. There is no universal answer possible. So Derrida asks himself, what is... Uh, what does it mean to be human in France? And by asking this question, he reminds us that this question is, uh, the question of what makes a human human is both universal and very specific. So after the war, after the first world war and the second one, there were two conflicting vectors in culture. On the one hand, after particularly the Second World War, there was a rise in humanistic and uh, neo-humanism thought. And there was a lot of interest in human rights and the image of a human, which is currently enshrined in so many legislations around the world. However, at the same time, you know, all metaphysics, all ontologists, all philosophical models of the world do not really answer the question of what a human is. In fact, he claims, they can all easily do without a definition of a human. Actually, after the war, there was a very strong need for thinking and rethinking humans, understanding what is uh, what makes us human, what makes our thought human. And here we can certainly think back to uh, Donna Haraway in the Ministry of Cyborgs. He actually described this uh, mentalist complex. And she said that uh, we can actually see humans as, uh, you know, complete, pretty rational beings with their sorts of values. But at the same time, you know, humans are much more complex than that. Well, because uh, there is the biological entity, there is the technological entity intertwined in a single human being. So this is a vector we're going to arrive at. And before that, I want to go back to uh, Jacques Derrida's work. So he actually tried to find where humans begin and where they end. So according to Derrida, humans appear on the margins, on the dog ears, so to speak. It is at the periphery, at the boundary with the animals and the machines, or maybe when they are exposed to death, that humans actually arise. So according to Derrida, being human is equal to being mortal. And uh, I should also uh, quote from Heidegger here, that humans are the closest to being because uh, they are open to Dasein, which according to Heidegger is uh, the most uh, non, or is completely non-human entity. 
so the being around us is uh, generally a non-human but being this uh, special entities we're open to it and one of these openings is death so it is its finiteness that helps death kind of connect our life to time now i've got these three statements about who humans are i'm quoting here from rene descartes ex human i think uh, is uh, the particular word quoted here so according to descartes human is he who actually discovered nature and that was a very special time you do remember there was a time when the first experimental laboratories were established and it is in these labs that animals and other natural beings were dissected experimented on and studied it is the world where words are becoming separated separated from objects and that was also the time when sciences uh, started uh, going apart because previously obviously you could easily combine all sorts of sciences in a single definition like uh, a dictionary definition of a snake before an art would feature all sorts of uh, ideas biological mythological and so on so artists of uh, renaissance discovered the horrendous nature of human beings think michelangelo you know when they made these first anatomic sketches they actually discovered the horrifying nature of human beings with their very precise drawings they were able to show you know the horrors that were hidden under the beautiful guise of the vitruvian person all the stuff that is being so much criticized in this uh, post-anthropocentric world medicine was obviously a very important way of discovering the world and also discovering the non-human inside the human now if we travel 200 years later to the times of rene descartes and he thought of humans as thinking machines composed of uh, pipes cogs and so on it's also an attempt at actually discovering you know the human nature while also deconstructing deconstructing the biology now descartes is also often criticized in anthropocentric thought as the person who actually separated humans from animals and transformed animals into machines and he also did say that humans were machines but cognitively capable machines and rene descartes obviously saw nature as antagonistic to humans which does resonate with the modern human being who is so technologically driven and technology dependent another statement that a human is in fact an animal my presentation doesn't click much good okay that was descartes so humans as animals here i want to go back to derrida there is another very important article by him entitled the animal which i therefore am so in this in this piece derrida tries to delve into what makes an animal an animal and where the full boundary between humans and animals lies so derrida says that human agency arises 
in a juxtaposition of human to animal. Uh, the whole anthropocentric culture is based on killing animals. That, you know, all the religions we can think of, be it a Judaism, Islam, or Christianity, are actually built on killing animals. Animal is the edge where we try to get rid of. Animal, animals are a cellar where we store all the things we cannot really recognize in ourselves. And whenever artists or whoever else talk about animals, they never mean a particular animal. Instead, they mean an image, they mean a symbol. And therefore, Derrida claimed that the experience of an animal is ultimately, I'm sorry, uh, it cannot be accessed, in ultimately inaccessible by humans, whatever tools we use. And there is also the issue of ethics here. Do we actually have the right to impose ourselves on this world? And both Derrida as well as Deleuze talk about the importance of talking face to face to animals so that we do not actually breach their boundaries. I guess it's uh, still Derrida saying that we can still try talking to them, but we should be aware that as we're doing this, we will be able to multiply our differences and setting these differences, we can get in touch with the animal. So exit animo is the neologism proposed by Derrida. This is how he is trying to talk about the amount of animal, so to speak, manifested in a human being. He is trying to put his finger on this multiple animality, so to speak. He says uh, neither species, no type, nor individual, but rather this. Um, um, I'm sorry, this uh, alive uh, multiplicity of mortals. And then he talks about Bellerophon, this layer of chimera, chimera. So he claims that uh, it is actually the perfect symbol for the evolution of human, because humans evolved in killing animals. Uh, figuratively speaking, I hope. And this makes me think about this exhibition. So we've got octopi and birds and plants. And here I found four very instrumental questions, which we often try to ask animals if we try to relate to them. Now, the first chronologically speaking question comes from Rene Descartes, and it sounds like, can an animal think? Now to Descartes, that was an important way of distinguishing humans from animals. Jeremy Bentham, British lawyer, actually asked a different question. He actually said it's immaterial if an animal can think, but if the animal can suffer, that's what matters. It is not in cognition, but rather in empathy and suffering that we can actually get in touch with each other. We can be we can engage in other and this makes me think of um, a particular scene uh, with um with a camel in a novel by platonov so chagataev walks in the desert and he sees a camel in the desert and the camel is so exhausted that it cannot actually uh, move close enough to eat, uh, you know, this uh, uh, squiggly plant there. So Chagadaev says he felt connected to this camel and he had empathy for the camel, but obviously the camel could not weep and he found he could not weep either. Which brings me to the next important question. First asked by Martin Heidegger, can an animal die? 
I guess that Heidegger somewhat uh, misunderstood the concept of Humboldt, who actually said that it's only humans who can die, who can approach death, because we have a cognition, we have a concept of death. Well, death simply happens to animals. I mean, they feel something, they can approach death, but they can never really die because they are not aware of the impending death. But now, when we are facing global extinction of species, when major climate changes are happening, there are so many problems which uh, get devalued or ignored by political leaders around the world. Well, in, in times like this, this issue of death becomes critically important. You know, studying animals, studying animal habits and animal rituals, interpretation of these rituals. In a world where species are dying, uh, lightning speed is very important, although I guess it's culturologists now studying it now. Actually, we have we have heard of, uh, say, animals like crows or elephants apparently having a notion of death because they do have rituals for mourning. And I guess that this is the current state of human science. Every world is finite, including that of an animal. And Derrida asked the question of uh, whether an animal is capable of, of being incapable. It's ultimately a question of whether we can actually stop pestering others with questions, incessant questions. How about we just let them leave? So I'm not going to take any more time by talking about the prosthesis, although if you have questions, I will be happy to go into it. Let me just quote here, or simply remind you of uh, this iconic work by Lynn Randolph, The Passion of Onka Mouse. This is also what Donna Harway is uh, musing on. To me, a laboratory animal, an animal that has never been exposed to, you know, nature, you know, a transgenic animal that was born in the laboratory, that has never seen the world outside the laboratory, that construes the laboratory as the nature. I believe that our understanding of our finiteness, our, um, well, embodied life, so to speak, needs to change with the appearance of such animals. You probably know that onca mice are used in laboratories to actually find ways to fight, for example, uh, breast cancer. But you see that Randolph actually has portrayed onca mouse with breasts and also the i'm sorry uh, she's also wearing uh, jesus's crown of thorns so it's codependent it's an animal it's a mammal saving other mammals unwilling as it is it is actually helping us fight cancer and well cancer is one of the most common symbols of death In this respect, the following statements will be quite important. What does co-presence with animals mean? Is it enough to actually uh, get yourself a shot of an animal's blood to become closer to an animal? Will that constitute a breach of the boundary between an animal and a human? This, uh, I'm sorry, uh, lab experiments are in fact 
well, sort of ritualistic. They are a sacrifice of animals. Animals and loves, including Ankemais, they have face. They are both objects and subjects, just like humans are. Let me also quote here from Tatiana Gorichova. She's got a great book called Holy Animals. In this book, she mentions that uh, Christian Orthodox tradition is possibly one of the very few religious traditions where uh, animals are portrayed and they can actually be portrayed as saints. So when we talk about boundaries, we often have this question of responsibility and how do we make sure we did not trespass other people's boundaries because obviously we do not have the right to do that. So it's a matter of being co-present, treating each other as partners. And if we're benefiting from them, we should give back to them. And very importantly, we don't have the right to do things to the other, be it a human or an animal, in the name of the greatness of uh, the mind or, you know, for a sacrifice. Okay, so being human is about discovering the animal inside oneself and treating animals from the perspective of responsibility. So, now should be the question time. Well, I'm inviting questions from the room first. And later on, we'll check if we have questions online. So please raise your hands, indicate who you're asking your question to, and then ask your question. Indeed, we will try to collect questions online as well. So please articulate your questions in the chat so that we can read them and, I'm, I'm sorry, ask them. Do we have questions right now? I see that Marion probably wants to comment. Sure, absolutely. If we can have Marion on the screen. Marion, did you want to chip in? And I want I want to mention that uh, uh, Art Orient Objet is a collective. It's not just Marion, it's also Benoit. I hope Benoit did not take it personally. It's obviously a partnership. So I feel so much has been said, uh, including by Yekaterina, that Marion would probably want to respond. So, Marion? Yes. The floor is yours. Um, I was very interested in, in Yekaterina uh, talk because, of course, um, it's very historical, which is quite interesting because you have to remind where we are coming from in, 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 in the way we consider the other. Um, what I wanted to say is effectively, there is, I mean, there, there are some representation of the animal uh, with sanctity, but the reality is that they, are, they have always been uh, put apart of, of the of the anthropological concerns like religion. They, they are just kind of companions, like, like the, the lion of, of Saint Jerome and so Saint uh, Geronimus. So the, the thing what, which interested me very much is um, to imagine how today those boundaries are reconsidered, which is something uh, that was not really present uh, in Derrida's text, it was just the start of a way we are rethinking the other. And probably it's because of those major concerns, which are ecological that you mentioned, um, which really insist and, and drive us to rethink the, 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 the companionship we have with animals. Um, I know that, for example, we have studies as artists, uh, the, the laboratory mice um, sample, and we were very surprised to imagine that they were even 
animals created uh, in laboratories only for the purpose of laboratories and progressively who lived um, any link with nature, you know, like what they call the axenic mices, which are mice that don't even have a, a microbiote. And they have been invented 60 years ago. And those mice are obliged to live only in laboratories, but not only in laboratories, in boxes, which would be uh, sterilized. And if um, uh, by chance uh, uh, microbes touch them, they are all killed because they should stay like uh, without microbes forever. Um, and, and this is, um, th this kind of animals um, interrogate us very much, exactly the way Ekaterina said. And, and we think there is a kind of, um, of, of, uh, of new artistic action to think about the, the, these possibilities of um, reimagining the way uh, we consider animals, not anymore as uh, useful things, but as uh, people living next to us. Um, for example, we imagine we could make a kind of uh, uh, mice in odor of sanctity, which sounds quite crazy, but the idea was to imagine that the mice would smell like um, anthropologists describe the smell of saints, which would be also a bio art work, but which would reconsider the, the, the idea we have that sanctity or, or religion could only uh, be human stuff. So th this, these are quite provocative artworks that we are working on because we are rethinking these problems of seeing the animal as something apart. And I think um, Ekaterin has show, shown us very, very much and very well the way it was linked to our history and especially the philosophical history we have from uh, Descartes and before. So it's, uh, I think we should more imagine that the hybridation that the Greek uh, and science were imagining um, could be more modern, finally, than what uh, succeeded to their philosophy. Спасибо, Майя. Но, уважаемые слушатели, мы видели фактически, как на наших глазах рождается идея. Thank you very much, Maria. We've just seen how new project ideas actually get hatched, right? I'm checking again if we have a. I'm sorry, if we have questions for our speakers, maybe to Marion or to the people on the stage, please raise your hand and indicate who the question should go to. Hello, Marion. Thank you for the description of your project. Uh, I was wondering uh, why your main interpretive strategy was to redescribe your new experience as uh, becoming a uh, horse like uh, have you considered an option that uh, after your procedures a uh, new type of perceptions like new sleeping regime and a new uh, kind of blood cell effects the, these are hybrid perceptions, nor human, nor horse-like. Uh, have you investigated uh, those territory of hybrids? Um, I tried. It's, it's not that easy because um, what we know in science is that specific molecules give specific effects. And if we could speak about hybridation considering the horse-human, experiment we did, it would be more like the way um, the human body reacts to the foreign um, component of the horse blood, which means, uh, you know, um, if you consider the way uh, those vectors work in the blood, it could be like keys and, 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 and place where they go. And those places has to be adapted to the size of the key, which means, of course, as human, we are not supposed to have the right uh, box to, to, to take the keys. And, and this, um, this is a kind of hybridation because what stays in the blood after 
um, what could be called a transistoric state, so something that will ever be moving and changing, is those boxes that has been created and that may, uh, provoke those reactions. Uh, we consider them like horse-like because, of course, they, they, were, they were copying the, the, um, the horse key. So they, are, they, they give effects that are very horse-like. But, of course, they are made by a human body. So they are hybrid, hybridized. And, in fact, well, what we don't know in the time uh, is how long we keep those um, kind of new immunoglobulins in the bodies. Uh, most of them will be there forever, just like a kind of vaccination. Uh, so they would react more next time I would have any kind of or thing in my body. And, and maybe they are the start of a new um, chain consequence that we don't really imagine. Lots of uh, biologists were afraid that um, there they may even be viruses in those kind of experiments that could be involved that are not supposed to be human viruses, but that could become human viruses because of the immunoglobulins that would make them able to enter my body, uh, which is the new way we are fighting uh, uh, on viruses, you know, like uh, AIDS now. We are imagining that kind of, of, um, of new um, of new component, which is exactly the kind of new uh, vaccination we invented for the COVID different ways. Uh, but actually uh, in that direction, that would be that I made an effraction in my body to a different microorganisms that would not be human-like and that would come from anotherness. Of course, after you are the kind of, um, uh, of hybrid, but I can't say it's a real hybrid because that would mean it would have an epigenetic reaction. And just now I'm, I'm trying to find it. Regularly I'm, I'm making a kind of um, complete genetic test of, of, my, um, uh, of myself. And I did not find now a uh, linkage that would be induced by the horse. So it's, it's a horse human reaction. So in that term, it's a kind of hybridization, but it's not an hybridization in terms of real genetics, which would be the, uh, the scientific uh, right way of thinking. Спасибо. Еще вопросы есть ли у нас в зале? Thank you very much. Checking for more questions. I wanted to discuss the link between life and the dirt. So Kate talked about Derrida being interested in animals. I wonder if Derrida had been alive now and had he wanted to talk to AI. So Sasha, had you been had you been Derrida, had you wanted to learn something from AI, what would you ask? Uh, now, Kate obviously knows much more about Derrida than I do. So, if if she's comfortable starting, I'm very comfortable being the second one. Well. There was a statement I had to skip because my presentation was taking a bit too long. And I have my own position here with the regard to the actual possibility of a usual discussion as we know it. I think that an escape from the human, escape to the periphery where we can meet the other. I think that's the dialogue. You don't uh, really need to talk. And if you're talking to robots, how do you know you actually understand each other? Uh, maybe there is a different question here instead. 
do you think that AI will have agency in the future or will it stay a tool? Frankly speaking, I'm not sure that such artificial intelligence is ever, ever possible. I have doubts. Now, you certainly know there are lots of tests, such as the Turing test, which try to discover if, uh, you know, your interlocutor, so to speak, is a robot or a real breathing human being. I think that talking to an intelligence like this would be uh, my way of checking if it has agency. And the simple discussion I would propose, I would ask AI what its mission is, why it lives. And the answer it would give me would help me classify it as having or not having agency. Yes, but agency is naturally very much related to responsibility. Now, let's look at a critical situation, like it's a self-driving car uh, and it, it hits and kills a pedestrian. There is obviously some responsibility involved, maybe not with the self-driving car, but at least, you know, with the manufacturer or maybe the software developer. So, and there are also ethical issues here at work, I guess, but I'm getting off on a tangent here. Let me check if we have more questions. So if you have a question to ask, please raise your hand so that we can budget enough time for you. Over there first. I'm Yelena Menchko, PhD in Culturology. I'm a philosopher, a philologist, and an expert. I've I've participated in the Science of Consciousness conference three times. It is with some surprise that I found myself here, but I am very grateful I am. Because you do give me a lot of food for thought. I actually have questions for each and every speaker. But first, I wanted to thank you, Yelena, for uh, how elegantly, as a philosopher, you've actually helped the participants in this discussion, the panelists, converge on the most important things. My first question goes to Marion. Let me first give you the context. I have not introduced myself any serum, plant or animal, but they have been dramatic changes in my sleep patterns. And uh, I did have this intermittent sleep pattern when I was working on an important part of my manuscript, which required huge cognitive effort. And I, I could only sleep for three hours in one go, and then I would woke up, I would wake up. It, I actually think I know why it happened, right? So my question is like this. I was writing down what you said, so. How long did your serum experiment last? And I'm, I'm guessing you did not really eat what horses usually eat, right? So you didn't change your diet that much. But uh, how well did you un start to understand horses in the course of this experiment? Well, because humans often want to understand uh, the other being. So do you have a feeling now you better understand horses like we understand cats or dolphins? You know, often people believe they understand their pets without words. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, first, I, um, I should say that uh, I knew that the, the reaction of this experiment were very specific since they started just after the experiment and they last not 
that long. I mean, it depends on the immunoglobulins, but for example, for the sleep, it lasts for maybe three, four days, and then slowly it became normal again. So, so this very short time of the effectiveness of the immunoglobulins made me think that, of course, it was the, the normal reaction of, of the experiment. Um, some lasted for very long, like you have um, components on the thyroids, on the um, different hormones uh, types that, that can last for months. And I should say that I was totally over the, the experiment, maybe three months later. Uh, so, so it depends on the different family because they have different temporality in your body. Then uh, you asked me, did it make me understand better the horse? It's difficult to say. What I understood better is that, for example, being feeling at the same time very frightened of everything, just like if uh, everything was um, attacking me in some ways, being extremely sensitive that way, and besides feeling extremely powerful, is not at all a human or a primate feeling. Normally when you feel um, anxious or uh, excited in, in the wrong way, um, when you feel anxiety, normally as a primate, you don't feel, um, you don't feel strong. You feel really uh, fragile. And at the same time, when you feel power, you're not fearing. You're supposed to be um, uh, confident. So this strange feeling of being both confident and fearing is very much the way the horse survived since the, the start of his life uh, in connection with um, the, the, his umwelt, his surroundings. So I think that, um, yes, in some ways, it made me feel that you have another way of living on that earth, uh, but not in a total mental way, in a bodily, in, incarnated way, which, which seems crazy, but there is an embodiment of the, of the knowledge in that kind of experiment, which is the price and, and the, the value of this experiment. Um, embodiment is the way you can uh, probably feel also that human is different. Um, that made me react, for example, because at the same time, I'm also a psychologist. So in psychology, you're always trying to care about this fear that people have, anxiety, which can drive to depression. And I thought it was wonderful because this experiment made me understand that you have a way to use the fear, not as a way to be fragile, but as, as survive a better way. And, and, and this is something I learned finally from the horse reaction. It seems naive, but, but this is so different from what we are used to feel that finally it made me learn something from, from the horse. Наше время неумолимо. Вы сказали, что у вас вопросы ко всем спикерам. Можно попросить вас тогда в рабочем порядке, в живом общении? И у вас был вопрос... Sorry, our time is limited, so... Uh, I will have to switch to the next Oscar. Thank you very much for this discussion. My question goes to Alexander. You have mentioned interaction between humans and technologists, and this begs my following question. So with the advance of neural networks, AI, do you think immersion of humans in virtual reality is possible so that we can actually create alternative life there? Can we be immersed in virtual reality for a long time? And if we are, how are we going to sustain the body? Wow, thanks for the question. Indeed, there is a major discussion now, both among culturologists and technologists, where people are trying to answer the question if we actually live in a matrix. You know, there are, I'm sorry, philosophers and technologists 
converging on the answer that the probability that we actually live in a matrix, like in the Matrix movie, that is, you know, we live in something which has been, you know, developed by a month, is actually very close to 100%. Like they say, everything we see in the world around us well, no, let me put it differently. Nothing that we see in the world around us seems to disconfirm this hypothesis. The big question is, with our level of technology, are we able to model a similar matrix now or not? So in order to calculate theoretically compute all the parameters for a universe the size of one cubic meter i'm sorry calculating the probability of the existence of such a small matrix will take you know current science several hundred years calculating the probability of our world being a fiction being the matrix is impossible at the current level of technology it's difficult to say when we are going to elevate our science to the level it will become possible and feasible. But in terms of immersing ourselves in a virtual reality, I can tell you that there is already a swarm of projects where you can work, for example, in virtual worlds. You can make money in virtual worlds, for example. Well, people make money in online games, for example. So you perform a function, you make money in this virtual game, and then you can convert this money into real money. Now, you probably know that in China, lots of people are involved or engaged in something called farming. You know, they spend their life in this virtual world, making virtual money and then converting into real money. So it has become the reality for at least some people. See, the more we try to learn more about our current situation, the more questions we have. And the exhibition that this conference revolves around should enable us to approach these answers through the lens of art. So I invite us all to thank our speakers, a great uh, Marine Laval Jantin, Alexandre Gustav, and Yekaterina Nikitina for giving you know, so much food for thought for our participants. Thank you very much and have a great day. Огромное спасибо всем спикерам и Елена Владимировна, вам отдельные аплодисменты. We're very grateful to all the speakers and let's have a round of applause to Yelena for moderation. I'm not sure Marion can actually hear us, but I'm so delighted. This is Daria Perhominka. I'm so delighted you were with us because unfortunately Marion could not join us for the opening of the exhibition and I know that she wanted to attend this conference. But in this new era of COVID, it has made it so difficult to travel, unfortunately. I think this session has been great, but actually we've got another striking session coming very soon, in about 15 minutes. Let's have a short break so you can uh, check out the cafe here. So let's take a 15 minute break and be back here, okay? and we'll try to learn in a non-anthropocentric way. So the next session will feature three artists and two philosophers who will help us reflect on what's happening. So please do not leave, okay? See you in 15 minutes.
good. We, we must be on air. We, we must be on air indeed. So we're starting this second session for those online and those offline. By the way, do we have lots of people watching online? And girls distribute the headsets. So what's our audience online now, Gina? Anybody has a number? Yeah, I think it was or never some like 40 people. But they didn't ask a single question. Guys, take it as a hint, okay? Even if you're online, that's no reason not to be active. Get in touch. Tell us why why you're listening and what's uh, got you interested. This is important feedback, you know? We, we want you. That's why we're making it available online. So our second session today, and you will remember that it's all about the exhibition called Let uh, the Other Live in Me. So our second session is about learning to think in a non-anthropocentric way, which I guess is the most unusual session and in a way the most courageous one. First, I want to invite to the stage Aya Kriman, who happens to be our only offline speaker. She's a philosopher and she actually works at Moscow State University Department of Philosophy. And Alina Hanova, who is also a philosopher, she's gonna moderate this session. And she also works at the Philosophy Department, Moscow State University. And now is the time, I guess, to actually introduce three speakers online. I do hope that technology is not going to let us down. So who shall we have first? What's the plan, guys? Whoever I announce, so what? Agnes Meyer Brandes. She's an artist from Germany, based in Berlin. Can we actually see her now, do you think? We also have Sasha Spachal. She is an artist from Slovenia. Oh, we can see Agnes now on the big screen. Hello there. Hello. And we're also seeing Sasha now. I don't know if Agnes can see me. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. should be now. Oh, Good. Uh, I can see you. After, I would say, such a hit on our exhibition. Yeah, Agnes is the author of a One Tree ID, a hit piece of our exhibition. But actually, just as equally popular is Earthlink by Sasha Spachel. Sasha. Hi there, a pleasure to see you. Such a pleasure to have you in this conference as well. Great to be here, thank you. I'm checking if Maggie and Renu are here as well. Oh, we see we see Ranu online. At least uh, we see that she is uh, she's already connected. Hi there, yes, I'm here. I'm oh, great. We, we, we don't see you yet, but I'm told that we have both uh, Renu and Maggie. So we know their work. If I were a cephalopod, I don't know if you've actually watched the previous session. You know, we actually have people in attendance here today who absolutely love the works exhibited here. Like people have been telling us that they've come several times to this exhibition. And this exhibition is indeed extremely popular. I Shall I say it's shockingly popular. Uh, I'm actually happy to hand it over to Polina. She's going to moderate the session today. Such a pleasure, really. We are going to hear now straight from the authors about this works. Thank you. Uh, I will be uh, speaking English uh, for uh, the sake of the majority of our speakers in this session. Uh, I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, and uh, I will introduce the main topics that we're going to discuss in this section. Um, 
it is titled uh, Learning to Think Non-Anthropocentrically uh, because uh, it is dedicated to new ways of thinking. Uh, it has become, I think, quite obvious in the recent years uh, that the traditional uh, ways and types of thinking that we apply to nature and to our relationship uh, with the natural world and the ways in which we conceptualize them uh, have led to a lot of unintended and quite drastic consequences. So uh, here we would like to discuss our potential ability to change this way of thinking and inventing new visions and new types of uh, conceptualizing nature and coexistence with nature for our mutual survival on this planet. Uh, can, we, can we actually uh, relinquish our inherent anthropocentrism? and how art can open up new ways of seeing the world and ourselves is the question. So uh, Agnes, uh, you're the first and welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, share my... Um screen with you one second so. so can you see my screen yeah we can good so maybe uh i i gonna um, introduce you a bit uh, into how the work which is now on uh, display in the exhibition one tree id yeah where where it comes from how uh, i developed it and um yeah in 2003 i was artist in residence at this uh smear forest uh, research station in hitjala finland and actually since then I'm uh, going back um, developing new projects and yeah this international research station is uh, focusing on nearly everything <laughs> what you can measure there around trees cloud formation uh, forest soil atmosphere and so on and um, yeah, I have uh, developed since then several works uh, going back again and again. Here you see the teacup tools, for example. Here another uh, workshop we realized there. Even yet, I just came back uh, yesterday night uh, from the station because we started there another new project with the uh, climate world and the University of Helsinki. But uh, when I was there, I mean, I, I myself, I uh, explored a lot of things around cloud, uh, air particles, air chemistry, and, and aerosols. And um, I encountered very wonderful methods to measure this invisible reality. Here you see these kind of chamber measurements. Um, yeah, to measure what the soil is uh, breathing in and out, that's a manual chamber. But um, for example, here also, this is a, a tree trunk chamber to measure what the tree stem is breathing in and out. And when I was there, I heard for the first time about these volatile organic components, compounds. Um, probably you all know um, what that is. I mean, this is, for example, what we can smell when we go into the forest. Very tiny, short-lived gas molecules. Um, trees emit these VOCs. These VOCs contribute to cloud formation. But VOCs is also a method of biochemical communication between trees, insects, plants, um, and so on. So, and when I was there, I, I heard that each tree 
emits his own very specific individual, um, has its own uh, VOC emission. So each tree creates its own cloud. So I was totally fascinated by this uh, specific VOC emission. And I thought, okay, what about we measure this very specific emission? And then I, we synthesize it as a perfume and then I can apply the perfume. And, and when I'm applying it, I'm actually wearing its biochemical communication system. So I can uh, communicate with the tree. I can, uh, I become a kind of hybrid tree. I can walk uh, towards the tree as a tree and, and have a talk with the tree. So that was my idea. It took a bit to be able to realize it because these uh, VOCs are quite difficult to measure, but technology improved. Here is the first um, one tree ID installation we could realize with the help of the university in Rostock. We measured this um, Himalaya cedar. And yeah, so it's, it's uh, in the exhibition, as you also uh, can realize here uh, in Moscow in the exhibition, you can apply the perfume and have a talk with the tree. Here's the one exhibition view from Moscow. But the tree is a whole universe of its own. So it's not uh, like the, the roots, the tree stem, and also the needles, they all emit different VOCs. So we measure like the roots, the needles, the tree stem, we measure them separately. Here you can see, for example, lately at a tree in Munich, these different um, measurement chambers. And here you see maybe the setup a bit better, the tree trunk, and we have also tubes going into the soil and, and to the roots. And here a chamber to measure what the leaves are breathing in and out. And these um, measurements, oh, that's our uh, tree stem chamber. Um, these gas samples, uh, they uh, get, are getting analyzed with a gas chromatograph, and then we can detect more than 100 compounds, for example. And these compounds, these molecule compounds, they form the basis for our perfume recipe. But even technology has improved so much nowadays, and if we might be able to measure 99%, there is maybe still 1% we cannot measure, but which is important for our uh, smell, for our nose, and also for the tree's communication. So I also work together with Mark from Ende, a perfumer from Simrise. And in collaboration with uh, Mark from Ende, we fuse like the machine data and the nose data to uh, synthesize them in the laboratory of Simrise, the company who is producing uh, these molecules, our um, perfumes. So here you see three perfumes, the cloud of the roots, the cloud of the tree stem, and the cloud of the tree crown. And from these uh, three perfumes, we fuse the whole one tree ID. ID like identity. So it's like um, the whole cloud of the tree, one tree ID. But it's actually super interesting how different the needles, the cloud of the needles, the cloud of the roots and the tree stems are smelling and how again together. In the exhibition, you can also um, smell the, the different uh, perfumes, cloud of the roots and the needles in the tree. So um, yeah. So you're invited to, to apply the perfume and you are wearing this kind of old fa factory costume. You're wearing the tree's communication system and approach the tree as a tree. And lately we were able to um, produce our first one tree ID do-it-yourself kit. You can order online via uh, um, developed platform. You can order your DYU kit. And then you can approach the tree 
with a, you can visit the tree with this uh, perfume kit and you can uh, conduct your own personal experiment with the tree at the tree and um, near the tree there is a qr code you can uh, uh, scan the code and get more information about uh, your individual experiments so so the um yeah the I idea is growing and hopefully there will be like this network of trees and wandering trees to towards the trees and uh, maybe i stop here but from walking trees maybe i stop with this because they that is where i just have been yesterday another way of uh, migratory tree um as we're going to start this project in the in the Sika Neva peatland in Finland, how trees are entering the peatland because peatlands are drying out and trees are entering. Maybe I stop my uh, short um, presentation here and keep it short so we, we have time for questions, Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes. Uh, that was uh, fascinating. Uh, and uh, we will take uh, the questions from the audience uh, in the uh, final part of this session uh, all together. Uh, but for now, uh, I have a little question um, specifically for you. Uh, well, you described uh, this process of uh, wearing this perfume and approaching a tree as uh, communication. Mm -hmm. And uh, what in your mind, are we communicating to the tree? What is the message? That is uh, <laughs> the very interesting thing because we are communicating with the tree. And of course, I would love to, um, to understand or, or to measure. I mean, I, I talk with many scientists, if it's possible, for example, to measure how and what the tree is um, answering or uh, how the tree is reacting. But uh, with the technology of nowadays, it's not possible yet to, to measure in real time how the tree is reacting. So we don't know. Uh, so far, we cannot understand. But it, it, that's the thing. We are communicating with the tree, but it's such a different dimension uh, of communication, which we are not able to understand. So, so I don't know if we're ever gonna gonna reach <laughs> this point or not. Uh, so we basically enter into a situation of communication where we are not sure what exactly are we communicating to our partner, right? Yeah, I mean, we have measured the tree specific uh, emissions. So actually, and we synthesize this. Um, its emission, its volatile identity, and we approach it with with himself. Actually, we are mirroring the tree from some days ago, so it might be quite confusing. Or maybe the tree is thinking, "Hey, who who is that? He he or she or it or whatever <laughs> is somehow familiar." And yeah, I don't know. We can uh, have a lot of. Uh, thoughts about it what might happen there yeah. or what not if if for example because i'm also investigating uh, the situation uh, of tree migration and and because trees always have migrated but super slow and nowadays climate change happens so fast faster than trees can migrate and i'm, I'm investigating various methods uh how uh, trees could walk and just walk away from climate change so for example when i'm wearing this tree's costumes and walk around the tree maybe the tree gets the idea of moving you never know yeah so the final uh, <laughs> sort of goal of the project may be you know herding trees uh with scents uh Wow, this, this is really fascinating. Uh, and uh, one uh, little question referring to our original topic. Uh, I mean, uh, can, it, uh, can your work be read as uh, 
an artwork designed for the trees? How, mu how much of it is for humans entering this interaction? And how much of it is uh, for the audience of trees? This is very hard to say because I don't know what the tree uh, is thinking or liking or so um, I cannot define this audience. But for me as an artist, I never define my work for an audience. For me, it's important that it stays free. So for whom or how it's communicating, it's always free and uh, can be without uh, sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, it's actually fascinating that in this section we have uh, two artists and two artworks uh, centering around this very intimate and personal action of breathing. Uh, and uh, another is uh, Sasha Spachal, uh, the author of Earthlink. Uh, Sasha, are you with us? Yeah, hello. So yes. please hello. Uh, mm -hmm. take the floor. Okay. Yeah, thank you for this invitation. And uh, thank you, Agnes, for your great presentation. I always enjoy hearing you speak about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. So um, I will share my screen to talk about Earthlink. So um, yeah, I'm really happy to be part of this conference uh, to think about working new connections with others in order to assure uh, hopefully collective survival of uh, uh, multiple species. So in this talk, I will be unpacking my artistic strategies and practices to relinquish anthropocentric bias. I would like to discuss how I learn not only about, but also with other than humans, as well as connections that are performed between various beings, be it human or other than human. So, but to ground this uh, presentation, I will talk about Earthling, the system of installation that is currently uh, exhibited uh, at Laboratoria Art and Science Space. So clim climate scientists, as well as cybernetic theory, have been telling us that we are immersed in feedback loops of connections, which on more simplistic levels might look as a nice and neat model of relationships as a traceable and even controllable uh, reciprocities. However, with an increasing number of connections being performed, the neat model Neat model dissolves into a pack world of complexities and multiplicities, almost impossible to model, predict, or understand. So it all becomes a bit of a mess. So we as humans like to, of course, contain mess or sort of make sense of it uh, with various words and metaphors such as networks, feedback loops, planetary metabolisms, ecosystems, entanglements. And some of these words even give us the illusion of a clean system that we might control. If we just try a bit harder to learn about it or develop new technologies, work through we could work through this mess and somehow also on the way save the planet. Unfortunately, the ecosystem is actually not a system. It's not a simple system or a model with precisely measured uh, or defined inputs or outputs, like some of the machines we as humans have built and use in everyday life. What we named an ecosystem seems more like an enormous mess of relations, entanglements of countless interspecies and intraspecies, reciprocities, somehow enabling each other's lives in the zone between soil beneath our feet and vast airless space above our heads. If you would look at simple entanglements in action, it would look a bit like this like an earthly system in an exhibition. Every human with a different mission trying to connect, trying to make sense of sensorial inputs, the body is receiving. Every human wording a different experience and hers, his or theirs stories. 
everyone together forming complex multiplicities together with other than human beings they are trying to connect with. And there are many plants, fungi, bacteria, archaea, human and animal microbiome, all involved in such a mundane process as breathing. Symbiosis, which means mean living together, is one of the key processes in connections between living organisms, which slides on the spectrum from no contact between organisms to parasitism, then to mutualism, and in the last stages of evolution, some organisms emerge with the other in the process of endosymbiosis into one organism. However, on this spectrum between no contact of two or more organisms to merging into one organism, things are again messy and far from linear. Symbiome, an interspecies negotiator, is one of the nodes or installations in the entanglement of Earthlink. While developing it, me and my coworker Miriam Schwagel have learned that the quality of symbiotic relationship can slide drastically on the spectrum. In this tiny miniature hydroponic ecosystem, symbiosis between the plant red clover and bacteria living in the roots of the uh, red clover is being measured and its fluctuations sonified and mapped as dripping water. While observing the symbion and hearing the changes in sound, it becomes obvious that symbiotic connections are always performed in the here and now, sometimes as parasitic and other times as mutualistic. Thus each moment opens the possibilities for a different kind of connection, a change as well as a formation of different kinds of ethics. Another thing is that even in a simple almost Closed system as symbiom, symbiosis is very much dependent on the wider environmental conditions, not only on the relationship between red clover and bacteria. Because in a couple of hours, this relationship can transform from symbiotic to parasitic or to non existent due to the nutrient change in the water tank, which shows that connections interactions or interactions are always time-based and endlessly transformable. Transience of connections contributes enormously to the opaque messiness of the environment we live in. This mess of relations I try to navigate with the following strategies. I try to set the stage to embodied experiences and practices of other than human beings and environments which give to the public a particular situated knowledge of a particular being. For example, this can be smell of bacteria, a touch of fungus, a taste of soil, and the like. In the case of inspiration, the breathing station, visitors get the chance to encounter soil bacteria, Mycobacterium vacae, with their smell while learning that their mood might be elevated as the bacteria is known for its antidepressant qualities. Another set of strategies is knowing, hacking, and questioning the technologies that are used to access particular other. Since a lot of other than human beings or their metabolites that I work with live outside of human scale of perception. Thus we need technologies such as microscopes and various sensors to know their existence and well-being. Another aspect of politics in the machines that I'm interested in is actually the power relation, which is encoded in the software or built into the hardware. Often I build machines that set the stage for spec speculative scenarios linked to problems in contemporary societies. An example of this kind of machine is again inspiration, the breathing station which by providing ag argumented breathing with air enriched so-called happiness bacteria also denies the same amount to everybody. The algorithm in the breathing station decides the amount of bacteria in each puff of air. In this way, the machine is performing the inequalities regarding the quality of air humans as are actually experiencing across the planet. The last set of artistic strategies that I will talk about today are storytelling and myth-making, which through its powers of world-making and sense-making are always connected to everyday practices and rituals we perform. Thus, by changing stories, we can actually 
change our worlds and also practices. In the expiration, the breath collector, the work sets up a stage for the public to participate in the everyday ritual of expiring, of breathing out, of letting go, while revealing the life potential of human breath by providing an externalized lung in the form of nutrient on a glass sculpture, where the breath microbiome gets a stage to perform. As I breathe out, I let go of part of myself part of my body. I can experience a moment of mourning of what has left the human body of its transience, but at the same time also healing by knowing it does live on in a different kind of form, a different kind of life. Breathing thus performs a multi-species act. My breath, my expiration gives life to other species. We as multi-species holobionts are breathing for each other, enabling each other's lives. In our lives, there will always be others, other than human others, as well as human others, produced by social systems and conventions. But how we connect to them is a decision made with each new act and each new interaction. I believe that artistic practices and st strategies can thus help play out some of the speculative approaches to other than human beings, to inform about the possibilities and maybe even help form different kinds of relationships to some of the most mundane everyday acts, such as breathing, by enacting them as multi-species act. For this panel, we were asked if art can be non-anthropocentric. Maybe, maybe not. But what happens if I stop seeing my human body as that of a contained and neatly packed human flesh? What if I see my body as multi-species performance in every here and now, in every breath? So could art actually already be multi-species and interspecies act, but we just need to give it space, stage and care to the otherness that lives with and through us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, fascinating. And uh, oh, m actually maybe Agnes has uh, some questions or comments on this. Mm. Hi. <laughs> yes. yeah. I just uh. turned off not to uh, to have a good stream for Sasa. No, uh, it's great to hear to your talk. And, um, but need to sediment a bit. <laughs> First. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually, uh, it's very astute in a way that uh, it also draws attention to our own body as a multi-species agent, uh, as in the bacteria and uh, uh, this uh, mass of symbiotic life that is actually always with us and uh, this very, very complex system. Uh, and uh, as uh, you rightly said, a mess uh, that is always uh, our body. It's already our body. Um, am I right in assuming that uh, your uh, thinking on this project was uh, inspired by, in, in some way by uh, the works of Donna Haraway? It was inspired by multiple works of multiple <laughs> philosophers, but also Donna Haraway was there. So yeah, yeah, because yeah, I, I hear uh, a bit of uh, you know her language in uh, mm. the discussions of and uh, inventing new languages uh, for describing these kinds of relationships uh, is very important because the languages uh, that we typically use, as you rightly said, are are created by the modern science that uh, was sort of designed to get rid of the best, to make everything into clear and uh, comfortable and usable distinctions. Uh, and 
art and technological mediation can provide us a vision that uh, uh, can sort of invite the mess back. Yes, exactly. And it can also, um, I, that's why I really like to uh, set up stages for experiences for the public, because I believe the more messier it gets and more people we get involved to have the direct experience with, with topics that are usually just scientific. And, they tr and we all start trying to describe what's going on with us we can maybe get to this other language that we're looking for and develop at the same time relationships to these uh, other beings that are around us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, now we can uh, invite to our conversation uh, uh, the uh, artistic duo Orphan Drift. Uh, and I think we have with us uh, Ranu Makurji. And uh, is Maggie Roberts with us or? Oh, yeah, both of you. Yes. Uh, very, very nice to see you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I suppose you have a video that uh, you were going to show us, right? Um, um, yeah, I, we sent in our presentation, um, so hopefully somebody has it. So yeah, roll the tape. <laughs> uh, I moved in London I... in the 1990s and have for a very long time been working with um, intersubjectivity, but also with otherness. Um, so we work collectively as a way of sort of building portals for um, voices of either different technologies or species or systems of thought um, to come through. Our piece, If AI Were Cephalopod, is in the exhibition at Laboratory right now. So I'm going to talk about that and Maggie will talk about some of the other work that we're doing. Um, if AI Were Cephalopod is um, a speculative see. work that is a four channel video installation that examines um, the question of what would happen if AI were modeled we on at the video cognitive right and behavioral tendencies of an octopus. Oh, um, uh, we chose the guys, octopus because it please. has nine brains um, that operate independently in each arm, guys, and then, I mean, eight uh, brains operating one in each arm independently that are connected by a central brain. Hello. Which means that in some senses <laughs> it is a collective and an in, in individual entity at the same time. Um, there are also just many things about the octopus oh, biology that is yeah. are really fascinating. <laughs> What's and going on? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, uh, our guests can at see the video, and uh, we have two audio tracks at the same time for some reason. Uh, ребят, uh, я так понимаю, наши гости не видят uh, видео, и что-то странное случилось с аудиодорожками. Oh. Please excuse us. Uh, our tech team will fix uh, this video in a minute. Um, uh, maybe for now you can uh, just say a few words uh, about uh, uh, how you uh, sort of arrived at this idea. Or maybe you have uh, uh, questions for Agnes and Sasha. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I mean, I wanted to say that I really enjoyed both of those presentations um, I and mean, it was really exciting to see work. I mean, I haven't been able to be there to see the exhibition, so I really appreciate being able to see the way the work operates, because when you just look at a photo, you can't see what's actually going on. And that's really fascinating um, just to think about in the visual art world that like the, the work is so sensual. Um, and I'm really curious about uh, the chemical aspect of your work 
and how you got into sort of, I mean, I think that our work is more speculative and we're just moving into a territory where we're working with an actual creature. So um, I don't know, I'd love to hear more about how you work with scientists and how you got into this territory of working with the, the chemical in particular or the invisible dimensions of communication. Either of you, because both the projects do that. I mean, it's it's a long process. I I started to work with um, cloud formation, drop formation, aerosol. So you when you work with that, you are already in air chemistry. You are. <laughs> so I'm slowly. Uh, oops, I can't hear you. Oh, what I just you? said yes. <laughs> ah, so okay. Yeah, so you I mean, it's it's a continuous pro process to 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 grow into this uh, universe of air chemistry. And when you are there, then you encounter like these volatile organic compounds. And I mean, this it's somehow fascinating. I mean, I first encountered this um, measure gas measurements and different methods and tools of gas me gas measurements at this forest research station. And it's fascinating this way uh, how to measure this invisible. For example, you take all these if you do it uh, manually, you take all these samples and you have the, like uh, this sample full of air. You and you don't know. Did I sample now valuable data or not? And you look <laughs> into this empty veil. <laughs> so it's a yeah, it's a very interesting. And only after having them analyzed with gas chromatograph, you and and then you detect, you find out if you did good measurements or not. If the data somehow makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then but do you feel do you feel close do you either of you feel like closer to the plants through doing this? Um I can I cannot say this. I, I'm wondering about this volatile alphabet in the air, you know? Mm -hmm. I would love yeah. to be able to discover to decode this volatile alphabet in the air. And I I mean, it's so amazing what there is all, all <laughs> such big universe. And also <laughs> we are always breathing in and out and don't realize it. I mean, I had this when I started to work with uh, aerosols and cloud cores that was in 2007. Mm. And then if you uh, 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 hear about like, there are 10,000 10, aerosols, for example, in one cubic uh, centimeter of air with the size of a sugar cube. Ten, if you have 10,000 air particles there, it's clean air. It's not mm -hmm. a lot. But imagine yes. the 10,000, it's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. So, but these were like aerosols also like this. So, of course, since 2007, and so I had to different uh, relation to what we breathe in and out and thinking about all these pollutions and, and so, yeah. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. you know um, well, like say we, we're very aware from lots of research into octopuses, which is the thing we've been trying to expand our sensory imagination through, I suppose, is how we, like you're so aware you don't have a chemotactile sensory ability that's conscious anyway, like my cells may well, but my processing awareness doesn't. And um, yeah, I was just really interested in the questions Rani was asking and your response of when she's saying, do you feel closer to the plants? But it's clear you feel much more aware of other kinds of senses than the five or sensory knowledge than the five senses we rely on you know most familiarly mm, mm. 
like is that a really interesting was that a conscious thing or something that's evolved for you um a kind of becoming or mm, i think it's more kind of becoming yeah but the interesting thing is for example i mean here uh, with my, if you have this kit and the, this yeah. i mean this is like the one tree i did kit and you take like you go with it to the tree so I work now with urban trees and you go out with your tree and you put the perfume. You need to put the perfume on next to the tree because this kind of biochemical communication is uh, very uh, depends on distance. So you need to be like uh, one or two me meter, not more far away from the tree. And when you put on this perfume there, I mean, there there is a real biochemical communication taking place but in the same moment it's very interesting what happens with your uh, consciousness and, and, and imagination and how you feel there then just mm -hmm. uh, answering your question doesn't feel make you feel closer to the tree I would I I can't see it really say I uh, when you put the perfume on something is happening but it's uh, I would say a lot there are many questions arising then. <laughs> so, it's, yeah. so it's not like, oh, I feel now closer, but I, I have, it's interesting experience and which uh, brings up uh, different or new perspectives and uh, questions. Yeah, the, that's sort of what I was trying to get, like the, the perspective shift in both of your work seems really important. Yeah, yes. Sasha, do you conceive of your work as communication with uh, the ecosystem that is in this uh, technologically augmented shell? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, uh, you are asking me or who? Sasha. Uh, Sasha. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, uh, for example, in inspiration, I I consider it's a, it's of course also a a way of communication because you get the uh, chemical compounds from the bacteria, Mycobacterium vacca, and you breed it in. So yes, exactly. But uh, I, I would just like to talk about what you were all just talking about. I feel like it's, something is, of course, chemical compound and this kind of communication. But there is so like this space that opens up that you go to the tree, you do the ritual, you do the thing. And it's like a lot mm -hmm. of things happen and you make the space for something to happen. And maybe more time this happens, the, the, the you know, like it's about like how we learned to walk. We tried a lot of times and then we learned to walk. So I, I see it as a, this kind of practice is going more times in, uh, in, the, in the relationship although we don't know what we're doing, but like, and then seeing what happens. So, uh, and of course, like chemical compounds and uh, all sorts of whatever that can help us make these rituals to, to do these practices are of course a good thing to start from. It's, it seems like we need something tangible. It's like, we, it's like, it seems we're in this kind, you know, we go from the material and then, uh, to, to build upon the whole world where it's normal to go to a tree and do the <laughs> communication like that, maybe. That, that's you how know I... the part of the um, questions this panel was asking um, about like what role can art have if, or something around that. It feels that we're all really ha completely um, happy not knowing or not having meaning, not having clarity and fact around this. And maybe that's for me something artists aren't looking for as a primary goal as um, traditional Western science would. Um, like that ease with not being able to articulate or know is, is, seems really key as well. Yeah, I would agree a lot. Like it, there's a lot of things that are, we, we, scientists have that job <laughs> to do the facts. And we, we are talking about how things are in the world and how we perform them and how, and that also doesn't have to do uh, always with the rationality of our minds, but other things. So that... Yeah, 
Uh, speaking of uh, rationalizing our uh, <clears throat> relationships with uh, non-humans, um, well, um, Maggie, Ranu, I'm uh, sorry, we will have to wait a little bit while our tech team is fixing the video. I uh, hope you don't mind if uh, we uh, give uh, the next uh, word to uh, our colleague Aya, uh, who will uh, uh, do her little presentation and then we uh, jump back to your video. Okay? Sure. Yeah, so Aya Kremon, philosopher, and uh, uh, so yeah, have the floor. Uh, yeah. Hello, I'm happy to welcome both my colleagues and the audience and naturally the artists. So my plan here is uh, to keep up uh, the trend of um, encroaching, if you like, um, on the others and the other languages as well. Now we'll be talking indeed about the feasibility and in fact the ability of understanding each other, how feasible it can be. Now let's assume it is possible and uh, if it is possible we can actually discuss both anthropocentrism, human, humanitaristics and modern art. I want to discuss with you how we found ourselves in our current situation. And ultimately arrive at uh, the main subject of this conference and this great exhibition. I hope uh, the artists uh, will have mercy on me if I happen to kind of freely interpret their pieces, their works. So talking of uh, post-anthropocentrism, I probably need to explain why is it post, uh, why so much attention to the anthropos, and uh, why we're actually passing through this uh, bifurcation point. Naturally, anthropos is about humans, And we should be thinking humanism here. And I should also explain why it's not humanism, but rather post-humanism. So according to Davis, all humanisms which existed until this very day would strangle all those they were not ignoring. And it's nearly impossible to imagine a crime which was not committed not in the name of humankind. So think Holocaust, think Gulag, think Nyig bombs. Think, all, think about so many things we've done to the environment. All this have been justified by a greater good for the humankind. And I guess this is a high time we actually rethought and to did a retake on humanism. Now Heidegger actually said that old humanism didn't work and new humanism was required. And yes, I am aware and I'm certain everybody else here is aware how uh, careful we must be with uh, this particular work by Heidegger. And just like Yekaterina Nikitina mentioned earlier today, Heidegger himself is actually extremely anthropocentric. So he, he likes saying that humans are the shepherds of being. 
да, в, контекст, в контексте его перезапыления and yes naturally language will change its shape and form as we rethink it but back in 1946 heidegger asked the question of whether we are in fact on the right track to understanding the human being as long as we are limiting human beings by thinking of them as being in a spectrum between animals and God. What are the symptoms of uh, the impending end of humanism? And uh, this is the thinking of uh, anti-humanists. So we know that in order for an era to end, the end of the era must be announced by a messiah by a prophet. And so the philosophy of postmodernism announced the end of mystic ideology and they opened the door for post-humanistic discourse. Symptoms of uh, the end of humanism includes the realization that humans are not effectively the main world builders and the cannot be any hierarchy among humans, think Holocaust, when we're talking about, say, an ideal anthropos, an ideal human being, say, a Vitruvian human being, whatever, they are synonymous. So whenever we start talking about them, we start building ontological constructs where a being gets lost. And if this is happening, then a linear hierarchical construct will start emerging with some species being considered less human than the others. And then powers that be, they jump on this bandwagon and they actually try to act on this mental con construct and perpetrate violence. And faith in ratio does not save us from an ever-present Zoe. Take the introspection method. 20th century has made us doubt the method of, in of introspection. Think Freud and his concept of unconsciousness, of the unconscious. What kind of self or introspection can we actually talk about if we don't really know where the boundary between self and non-self lies? So Zoe is obviously something uh, from uh, the elements, so to speak. Something that belongs to the non-static, chaotic structures, such as women, by the way. So obviously, the ratio can no longer be a guiding star for our thought in the modern discourse. Naturally, we cannot reject agency of non-human selves. And since time is linear, and this is actually something that these uh, artists have shown, you know, time, I'm sorry, time is not entirely linear. And uh, in the case of the recent pandemic, and what uh, has recently been mentioned that, you know, there is stuff you cannot really see, like air in a sample or aerosols in the sample. So these things cannot be excluded from the field of our analysis. And naturally, a human being can no longer be the yardstick for everything. Take the virus, for example. You know, this virus is reshuffling so many constructs that surround us, uh, be it states or personal relationships or what have you. So what's happening right now is a post-anthropocentric turn. Uh, let's distill the essence of humanism and anthropocentrism. And actually, we need to quote from Heidegger on this one. Actually, uh, natural philosophers and even uh, Roman and uh, Greek philosophers also talks about it, but it was Heidegger who actually focused our attention. 
on this one as uh, actually one of the main question of philosophy what is what is a human being yeah i see we have comments and questions but if we can kindly keep them till the end thank you so kant said that we actually tend to answer all the main uh, questions of philosophy by answering the question of what makes a human being and it is indeed the centerpiece of the humanist discourse and this makes me think of donna haraway and the era of Anthrop anthropocene which naturally gives rise to post-humanist theory here i want to use my own term post a non-human actually the question of what makes a human being is no longer that relevant and the classical anthropology as we know it obviously cannot exist or let me rephrase it it can exist but it will lose relevance in terms of answering the questions asked of us by the modern times now i will quote here from yekaterina nikitina you heard in the first session in the conditions of post anthropocentrism the uh, shifting boundaries between nature zoe and culture bias begs the question of uh, the uh, i'm sorry of uh, the possibility of uh, escaping the crisis of humanism so post anthropocentrism leads us towards post humanist theory and to finally transition to the object art that we're discussing here i want to very quickly list some of the key cases in the post humanism uh, one is uh, that uh, discourse is getting de-anthropologized. Now, we are trying to escape the violence of binary oppositions, and we're also seeing a dilution of boundaries between human and non-human agents. So with this post-anthropocentric shift, we are seeing old concepts failing to serve us reliably. Now we realize that terms such as classical terms need to be reloaded and reconceptualized because they no longer suffice to explain or even describe the complex processes that we are observing. So if we want to work with this reality, if we want to describe it, we need to refresh these terms. So this is, in fact, a comparison of anthropocentrism to post-anthropocentrism. On the left is antro, and it's hierarchical, and human means rational, means consciousness, and uh, full learning and discovery. And uh, we contrast this with the de-hierarchization and post-cognition. So for anthro, culture is uh, juxtaposed to nature and humans own the language and own the text and social uh, phenomena are produced by humans now let's look at post post cognition covers not just human cognition but non-human agents as well and language is not just a system of science but it's in fact a space where both human or post non-human meet we have uh, rather than the opposition of culture and nature we have a combination of this and we have uh, intraspecies ethics so i am going to actually say a few words about the project we've heard about i think that what's happening here is unbundling of hierarchy a human being is just one of the participants of the communication process here and we are focusing the attention of the audience on communication with the invisible agents such as bacteria this one is post cognition i'm uh, referring here to the book unthought by hales she actually writes there that uh, cognition should also apply to neural networks 
and even the primitive uh, life forms. So she says that uh, as soon as we actually uh, change our actually erroneous assumption that we are the only important uh, cognizant being, so to speak, or beings doing cognition, we'll actually have to ask ourselves lots of new ethical questions. There is obviously some cognition happening in an octopus, uh, monstrous as it may seem. And uh, neural networks are also monstrous in their own way. And they're also doing some like cognition. So just like uh, Haraway said, we need to be thinking in terms of natural cultures and becoming with. Now Foucault famously deconstructed notion of uh, human, while Descalon deconstructed notions of culture and nature. And another project which was uh, mentioned earlier today is worthy of separate attention. You know, when we are deconstructing the, take, the dichotomy of nature and culture, we will discover lots of hierarchies. Like intuitively, we sort of assume that culture is more important than nature. So when we're dealing with this, when we're dealing with this opposition, quite, uh, I'm sorry, we're sort of bound to arrive in a space where new ethical questions will arise and we'll be talking in terms of non-species, I'm sorry, non-species specific ethics. So let the horse live in me, I think is a very vivid illustration of that. Yes, thank you very much, Aya. This has been a very detailed way of contextualizing our discussion and providing modern philosophical terms for that. This discussion, and uh, I hope uh, we can try to run the video again. Can we? Yeah, please do. Hello. Hello, I'm Ranu Mukherjee. I am um, one of the co-founders of the collective artist and avatar Orphan Drift. My collaborator Maggie Roberts will be speaking after me. Um, we emerged in London in the 1990s and have for a very long time been working with um, intersubjectivity but also with otherness. Um, so we work collectively as a way of sort of building portals for um, voices of either different technologies or species or systems of thought um, to come through. Our piece, If AI Were Cephalopod, is in the exhibition at Laboratory right now. So I'm going to talk about that and Maggie will talk about some of the other work that we're doing. Um, if AI Were Cephalopod is a speculative work that is a four-channel video installation that examines um, the question of what would happen if AI were modeled on the cognitive and behavioral tendencies of an octopus. Um, we chose the octopus because it has nine brains um, that operate independently in each arm, and then, I mean, eight brains operating one in each arm independently that are connected by a central brain, which means that in some senses, it is a collective and in, an individual entity at the same time. Um, there are also just many things about the octopus biology that is are really fascinating. And I think with this piece, we were trying to to listen to it and also to think about what would happen if we thought of AI 
um, under a different system of intelligence. And um, Maggie will talk about the way that we're pushing that idea further. Um, so this is a four channel installation that um, breaks up space in a way that allows there to be a sort of confusion of figure ground, something like what we imagine might happen um, underwater for a, a creature with a different kind of perceptual system. The piece is actually, de uh, it's designed based on the colors. It's, a, the, it's storyboarded based on a set of colors that represent the what what colors that the octopus turns when it is in a certain certain state. White being a fear, calm, or being um, death. Um, orange is kind of a state of excitement. It goes through purple and blues, which is anxiety. Um, Red and white is a courtship ritual that the, the octopus goes through where half of its body turns red um, to attract a mate and half of its body turns white to repel other, other potential mates. Um, and then there's chroma chatter, which is this exuberant um, color shifting that the octopus does. Um, so these states, we used those states to storyboard a film, so that was one of the ideas. And we also wrote a text that's a really important part of the work. If AI were cephalopod, its moods would be visible in waves of radiating color. States of calm, anxiety, and fear, approach and retreat would be on display. If AI were cephalopod, it would experience exquisite sensory intimacy and exude the smell of geraniums when stressed. If AI were cephalopod, it would be our witness. It would explore us through probing touch. It would taste us to decide whether or not to trust. It could predict toxicity and choose the benign relationships. If AI were cephalopod, it would be a voracious predator. It would be curious, plastic, and opportunistic. If AI were cephalopod, it could hide in plain sight by appearing equivalent to its surroundings, no matter how fast they shifted. If AI were cephalopod, it would have three hearts and see with its skin. If AI were cephalopod, it would haunt the human imagination as monster weaving its way into legends and mythologies. If AI were cephalopod, it would be 500 million years old. If AI were cephalopod, it would have bright pink collagen and blue blood. If AI were cephalopod, it would be indifferent to its own and curious about the outside. It would furl and unfurl changing scale across time. If AI were cephalopod, its presence would expand with the warming oceans its reproduction time would speed up and mess with mating in the process. If AI were cephalopod, it would hide in dopamine-infused clouds of ink. If AI were cephalopod, it would live fast and die young. It would adapt to the changing climate. If AI were cephalopod, we would never presume to fully understand it. We always wanted to make sure that our work is experiential. So it's a combination of research and manifestation of what we feel um, through this otherness. Hi everyone, I'm Maggie. Um, the other co-founder of Orphan Drift. Um, I'm going to share my screen. In Donna Haraway's book, Staying with the Trouble, she talks about speculative investigations that become propositions, that become paradigm shifts, and about the details in a story mattering, and the perspectives of the voices that tell a story too. My Becoming Octopus Meditations is about the emergence of a less anthropocentric, more fluid, porous and distrib distributed kind of subjectivity. And about remembering the intelligence of bodies where the sensual is the first sight of understanding. Working with a renowned interspecies communicator, 
Help me to connect with the octopus's life world mapped by its nine brains, colour as language and chemotactile information gathering. This involves familiar visualisation techniques, quantum physics and telepathy. You begin to sense the underwater environment as colour, pattern, light, pressure, ebb and flow. There's no horizon or perspectival navigation. There is 360 degree sensitivity through skin and sucker touch. The octopus uses its seeing skin to reflect. And you shape pupils to bend light into the polarized spectrum. Half of the octopus's neurons are in the eight arms. So eight separate sets of information are spread out across the environment in eight different directions simultaneously. It is both individual and collective at once. We felt the necessity of developing new visual languages that can explore more than human perspectives for a while now. In the animatic apparatus, Deborah Levitt proposes that Digital animation is a tool for developing perceptual and aesthetic languages that no longer privilege the human and move away from the recognisable towards the unknown. It is expansive and questions subjectivity, gender, reality, materiality. The meditations use 3D animation softwares to develop experiments in fluid patterning, texture, colour, constructing eight simultaneous viewpoints, and protein forms. ISGRI, Interspecies Communication Research Initiative, in development for over two years now, is a collaboration with machine learning consultancy Etic Lab, partnered by the Serpentine Gallery in London's Creative AI Lab. We aim to train an AI that gathers data from sensors placed in an ocean tank housing a common octopus, responding to art inserted into its environment. Its responses will be registered by the sensors, measuring, for example, colour change, light, movement, water pressure. Processing the sensors' data, the AI system will emerge through the latest unsupervised machine learning, ensuring that it's not learnt primarily from a human-modelled environment, but from a fellow distributed consciousness, the octopus, that operates in and cannot be perceived as separate from an uncertain and fluid environment, the sea. Video content will be modified by the AI as it develops, and this in turn mediates the octopus's responses, and these are then fed back again into the AI's learning patterns. We hope this process will slowly produce visual material that will not reproduce a human-centric aesthetic, rather that the AI might communicate with the octopus in ways we cannot recognise. Whilst humans initiate the work, we intend that the art, modulated by all three elements, the human artists, the curious octopus and the synthetic AI, will eventually be a form of communication made visible without the conventional expectations of our interpreting what this might mean. Being part of a co-evolving communication experiment with such multiplicity feels imaginatively, ethically and ecologically urgent. So we're thinking about how to make art of interest to an octopus a distributed intelligence that does not prioritise vision-led perception in the way a human does. We do not know how the video streams might be perceived or interpreted, although research confirms that octopuses register screens as a space of sensory engagement. We're generating streams of pattern, colour and shape based on mimetic learning approach. From our research, the work with the interspecies communicator from my diving, we think light, colour and texture rhythms experienced underwater might be a shared place to begin. All patterns. One of our computational artists talks about interpreting the life world of the octopus in terms of coding processes, sine wave motion, fluid space, flocking behaviour. We've researched into octopus skin patterning, its colours, and moods expressed, and the emotion-based skin colour changes to simulate them. We're generating synthetic skin patterns as terrains and working with procedural dynamics to create tentacled objects that react to each other. B 
being computational, these experiments are necessarily generative and emergent. This is part of the mimic skin reef, which animates a series of textural skin layers, conveying a sense of touch that tastes and sees pressure and vibration. Iskri asks if, by registering exchanges between two very different from us intelligences made visible through artworks, we can learn to sense modes of communication we can't and may never understand logically. The second phase of the project will be a touring exhibition in which the Octopus AI now modulates artworks in a gallery space as human visitors engage with them, replacing the octopus. The intention is that we become more octopoid in our responses, sensitive to more abstract, multisensory, inconclusive forms of interaction, as we gradually sense an alien presence in the room that is choreographing the rhythms, intensity, distribution, tactile pressure of, for example, ripples of colour, pattern, light reflection, camouflage, haptics, our movements. All of these, except the last, are already forms of communication outside Western human systems of language and representation. So thanks very much from both of us and see you. Um, so yeah, well, finally you were able to see the video and thank you very much, uh, Maggie and Ranu, uh, for uh, presenting uh, your project. Uh, I particularly am fascinated by uh, it uh, showcasing the inherent anthropocentrism of uh, the traditional sort of approach to AI modeling you know, as uh, the human thinking uh, sort of uh, by default uh, is used as a model for any kind of thinking and uh, here you present us with uh, a, an alternative to this and uh, this is really fascinating. Uh, Could you so, see the video? Come again? Could people see the video? Yeah, yeah, we could see uh, the video and yeah. I couldn't, but oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, I believe we have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, there is a bit of a ruckus there in the first row, but so far nobody has grabbed a mic. Hello. So as part of this discussion, I have the following question. For a long time, our anthropocentric thinking has been driven by the need to keep fighting nature because it was seen, in fact, as a way to survive on this planet. So I'm wondering what the authors of this very interesting project think. Now this uh, turn away from a priori anthropocentrism. Is it driven by the fact that we are feeling so much safety and security, we have so much comfort in our life, that we can easily engage with other objects and uh, other subjects in nature? Is it because we just feel safe dealing with them? Or is it on the contrary, because we feel fearful. Maybe fearful that our impact on nature can lead to, in fact, collapse of human civilization. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, it's a question to Megan Brano. 
right? Uh, could you hear the translation? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was to everyone. I thought the yeah, I thought the question was for everyone, but um. <laughs> so the I'm sorry. The question is about whether it's we're where the which direction the fear is going in. Whether it's about our the fear our fear of our ourselves destroying the world. Is that what you're asking about? Well, why I think it was that why why are we now engaging with other species or lots of interest in non-human life and our relations with them? Is it because we feel comfortable in our late capitalist glories or is it because we um, are watching the biodiversity etc um, collapse around us due to our actions? Right. Maybe? I mean I think it's not comfortable. I think mm. I think this comes out of extreme discomfort. I mean, that's the way I would see it. And also like a recognition that we are leaving out so much um, that the kind of systems of, uh, the systems of um, like understanding what is intelligence or what is knowledge are really lacking as we see the agency of other beings um, get louder and also the damage that we're doing or we have been doing for a very long time get louder. Agnes, uh, Sasha, do you have uh, anything to that? I, mean, I, I would say it's a uh, the motivation is not fear at all. It's more like a respect and curiosity towards the world I'm living in and towards the otherness. It doesn't have to do anything with fear, but with respect and curiosity. Would you think there's maybe a sense of responsibility in that respect that we wouldn't have been talking about 20 years ago though hard to say i don't know <laughs> what i would have done 20 years before <laughs> i mean of course my works evolve uh, from my from me being living here in this world and experiencing it i i Hard to say would have been in 20 years before. I feel like there's an increasing sense of responsibility in my creative being to use the skills or the sensitivities we have to open questions and help the debate, build community, um, new language, just lots of stuff that maybe I didn't, um, you know, just language, just so much, like thinking about publications, you know, so many books being written now about the Anthropocene and ecological crisis and what we can do, you know, all our different, and about multidisciplinary um, projects. I suppose I feel like that's all increasing along with the, um, the fact that our machines are, are making visible a lot of patterns that maybe I wasn't aware of in my youth to do with anything from weather to biodiversity to, um, you know, the cost of extraction for te new technologies, just endless endless things. I have different kinds of pattern of information around than I did a, lot, a while ago. Yeah. Mm. Well, you spoke of responsibility. Uh, uh, it's a question to all of you, probably. Uh, do you think that art is uh, really capable of changing the 
people's uh, way of thinking and uh, dealing with uh, otherness. Well, I thought that's our job. <laughs> <laughs> I, it is like I think art is like changing perceptions and like that's that's our job that's what we do and we try to communicate that and as best as we can so like, I think this is not really um yeah that's my th thought on it yeah yeah I agree I think that is our job um I don't know if it always works but that's another whole whole discussion which you know, I mean, just to go back to the notion of curiosity over fear, um, you know, you have to try, right? <laughs> so I think that it can certainly convince some people, people, or, you know, I can, I can convince people or, or hopefully species that are open to maybe um, accepting some shift in attitude from us or Maybe there's maybe there's eventually a noticing. You, like you, one can only dream about that. But I think um, it is capable. I think it's very slow. I think it's a slow form of communication. And I think some slowness is okay right now. As trees move, yeah. So yeah. slow, slowly as a tree moves. Uh, okay, <laughs> I think we have uh, one more question from the audience. Да, спасибо. Я задам его по-русски. Yes, thank you very much. Now this question goes straight to Sasha. Indeed, an exhibition bringing in so many artists and focusing apparently on the other, well, it still emphasizes the human being. However, I feel that emphasizing the other we're actually making it so important, so imperative for the person to well, own a place vis-a-vis -vis the other. And my question to you is like this, what's the role for the human being in your particular work of art? Thank you. I would like to extend this question to all of our speakers, actually. Mm, first, the role of human being is basically to connect, to, to be part of the whole system of installations that is there to explore, to be curious, to smell, to listen, to touch. And um, yeah, just like that, um, it's being part of the ecosystem, not the main uh, being that is making the system. So, uh, and learning through that, that there are particular, um, hmm, how do I say? There is a particular tension that that comes with being in this uh, in, in environment. The tension of uh, of negotiation, almost like if it's safe for your body or not safe for the body, or where the other is. How the, does the other feel? And like just the being the whole observer of the changes and interactions that are coming. So I would say that just to open up to this new space where things are developing. I think like that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, is that it? So, uh, Thank you all, and uh, thank you to our brilliant speakers, uh, to Agnes, Sasha, uh, Megan, Ranu, and Aya. Uh, please give, the, give it to them. <laughs> I understand that the time is pretty much out for this session. But we still have questions. And it, by the look of it, people are dying to ask these questions. I guess they're coming from philosophers. It's good that philosophers love arguments so much. <laughs> Shall, shall we entertain? Let's entertain one more question, okay? 
I also wanted to ask a question about artists, says Daria. Oh, right. Irene is right. I'm sorry. My bad. We also need to make a book presentation by Donna Haraway. I'm so sorry. I thought we still had a couple of minutes left, but we don't. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry about that. We cannot accept any more questions. But if you can hear me and if you can see me, can you please switch your videos on? My favorite artists. I'm, I'm waving at you. It's such a pleasure to see you, beautiful people. And I'm so happy to have you at this conference, even if online. I know that Maggie is now in Cape Town, is this correct? Ranu is somewhere in LA or at least in California. <laughs> Sasha must be in Slovenia. Agnes is in Berlin. But you know what? This section and this exhibition, they feature so many women. And it's indeed very important. That is no coincidence. We actually have a great feel for the other. And we have so much empathy. It is quite unusual, actually, that this whole session is dominated by women. Researchers, artists, you may say it's symptomatic. You may think we are lacking men. But let me assure you that when I thought of people to invite, it never occurred to me to maintain, you know, some gender quotas. It just worked out this way. Thank you so much again. I'm waving at you. I'm sending my love. I hope that uh, this uh, whole, uh, you know, COVID nonsense is going to end soon and we'll finally get to meet again. And now, we do not have a break, by the way. Right away, we are going to have a presentation of a book by Donna Haraway. Will you have, will you make a short introduction, by the way? No, I'm not going to make a long introduction here for sure. I'll simply say that this book directly or indirectly has been mentioned by all the artists you've heard today. And I was also inspired by the same book, indeed. And yes, and me as well. It became a very strong, a very powerful inspiration for this whole exhibition. Actually, at the time when the exhibition was in preparation, it had not been translated into Russian. But a Russian translation of this book is out. And we would like now to invite the publishers, Yana and Dmitri. So the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you very much for your invitation. We're happy to participate in your great conference. I'm Yana Tsirulina. I'm a publisher with Gelly Press, and this is my colleague Dmitri. And I believe that our editorial policy would have been impossible without him. Now, that must be too much. So we are going to present to you our recent publication by Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble. Actually, the book was published in 2016, but in Russia, it only got published in March this year. And I guess your great exhibition and your great conference show how topical this book is. It keeps inspiring lots of artists lots of people who are speculating about what's happening in the world now with the help of art. Now, for the benefit of those who you know, some Mishap may have not heard about Donna Haraway yet, let me quickly explain that she is a professor emeritus at the University of Santa Cruz. And she is, uh, you know, numerously decorated because she has done a lot across the board of humanities and social sciences. Now, she became as, I'm sorry, as well known as science can be. So she wrote 
some critical work, some uh, fundamental works in culturology and elsewhere. And she also became a, one of the key researchers in the field of post-humanism. Why this high demand for Donna Haraway? Now she is applying cultural practices and she's seeing science as a combination of socially constructed practices. She also pays attention to how technological knowledge is related to global capitalism, destruction of the environment. She's also paying attention to gender, ethnic and other types of violence. And what's particularly important here, she's rethinking subjects uh, such as, you know, kin, subject and object, body and mind, culture and nature. Haraway became well known thanks to her cyborg manifesto, which is effectively a fundamental text for the cyber culture. However, today I want to discuss a different book, which is equally iconic. In Staying with the Trouble, she actually talks about uh, this relationship between a human and the world, between culture and nature. I think this is time for me to hand it over to Dmitri, who was actually the editor of the book. Yes, uh, hello again. I understand we don't have all the time in the world. Actually, I guess here we have very little time for this speech. So my plan is to focus simply on the name of the book and the key notions woven into this name. And not surprisingly, they also serve as the main subjects of the book. Now, I would love to discuss, you know, translation dilemmas and challenges, but we don't have the time for it. So it's called uh, Making Kin in Cthulhu Scene, Staying with the Trouble. Now, the name sounds quite imperative, right? Which is not surprising. It is indeed a manifesto. I mean, the book is pretty long by modern standards. It's over 300 pages long. Nonetheless, it is a manifesto. Now, the manifesto parts, you know, we sort of shifted to the second part of the name. We could have shortened the name, but we decided against it. So if you live through it, you will see a lot of imperative statements like making kin, uh, sowing the seeds or something like this. It's important for us, however, to look at three terms which are fundamentally important to this book. Actually, all the three you can find in the name. One is the trouble Actually, we chose a particular Russian word for trouble because Donna Haraway actually talked about stirring or boiling. So the Russian word is closer to the stir. And unlike other translations of the word trouble, which would be more like issues or trouble, the one we chose has a more positive ring to it. Because indeed, in this total chaos, lots of good things can arise. And in a situation like this, you know, even the good solutions appear like they are going to create even more trouble going forward. However, the state itself is positive in a sense. It is a sort of a solution. 
So it is not a problem as Gilles Deleuze would uh, consider it. It is rather a way of seeing the present, which is now being refuted by the past. So we are sort of focusing here on uh, the present and its ongoingness, which is another important term in the book. So this trouble is quite characteristic of the modern times. And there are so many names you can call it. So Haraway is using these names for different ways of uh, conceptualizing the modernity. And one of the chapters is actually called like that. Anthropocene, Capitalocene, you know, one more scene, and Cthulhocene. Cthulhocene is a key term for her. It's something she uses, you know, to uncork, to better conceptualize the three other scenes. Anthropocene is the least relevant term for her because Anthropocene is effectively about smearing the guilt, so to speak, across the whole of humankind, regardless of uh, the lives different people are having. I think we cannot really pin or heap the blame on the current state of things on, say, Eskimos or Inuits. Like, they shouldn't be getting the same portion of blame as Europeans, right? Because their lives are so different and their contribution to our present day problems are different. The other terms, except for Cthulhu scene, are also not very relevant to her. Take capital scene. If we focus too much, on uh, sort of claiming that capitalism is about alienating and capitalism is like the main culprit. Uh, uh, that's also, sorry, it's not rudimentary, it's oversimplification. So the third scene, which is like plantation scene, it is indeed, a pretty relevant term for her and she claims that you know by heaping all the resources by uh, effectively robbing uh, the planet we rob ourselves of the future so our current life is actually designed to overcome this double material death where we're killing species And by doing this, we're actually undermining the possibility of further evolution. And this actually undermines ongoingness. So Harway suggests making kin and intraspecies communication. And interestingly, she says kin according to Haraway, is very different from kin as we usually know it. It's pretty much everybody but your family. So establishing these relations in our troubled times, restoring ongoingness in their actual present and in their situations is, if you like, the but or the imperative of this book. Thank you very much, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much for being able to cover something so important and something so profound. And indeed, this book, I guess, is being quoted everywhere now. We're very thankful to you.
Thank you so much for finding the time and sharing your thoughts with us. It's such a shame we don't have time for questions, but I believe that this book can be easily found now. Sure, sure, in all the online stores. And you can find it in Flunster and Tsiolkovsky. In fact, all the independent stores. Uh, so it's already available in uh, cities outside of Moscow, such as Tumen, Yekaterinburg, Tomsk. So most independent bookstores carry it now. We know that the book has been long awaited. So we have a sure distribution. This is great news. Thank you very much. Uh, we are saying goodbye to you and we will continue because we've got our third session and we want to start it in roughly 10 minutes. It will be very different actually. It will mostly include practitioners. That is, you know, practitioners thinking about art and science as a platform, as a communication channel, like where it can help and how we can engage various communities. And we will have uh, speeches and presentations by several people who have already pulled off a bunch of successful projects they are going to share with us. We have about a 10 minute break. And in 10 minutes, we shall be happy to see you back. Thank you.
pas habitué tant que ça. Добрый вечер всем. A pleasure to welcome both the offline audience and our friends online. All those, you know, who have the resilience to stay through three sessions. We are starting session three. We'll be talking about dialogue with new communities, experience of a new dialogue between communities, to be precise. So what is it that we're going to discuss? Naturally, well, we'll be talking about new communities and actually they often have a new definition for dialogue, but also the role that art can play in this new dialogue. And I guess different speakers will infuse it with different meanings. What's interesting is that this session contains nobody but practitioners. You know, we had lots of philosophers in the previous two sections, not here. Here we're going into exchange practical experience, hands-on experience. And I'm happy to give you the speakers. Next to me, we have Alexei Budikov. He's an artist, an anthropologist, and a co-founder of a project called, uh, I'm sorry, Urban Fauna Laboratory. Also connecting online are Daria Mille, and she's a curator at ZKM a museum in Karlsruhe, and actually a good partner of ours. It's actually one of the most important museums in the world of technological art. Hi, Daria. And also we have Ursh Weber, another colleague of ours. He is the head of Project Atoll, a very important partner of ours, a very good friend from Ljubljana if I remember correctly, the Paris of Eastern Europe. And the guys actually produce fantastic works. It's a shame we are not sitting here together, but it's a pleasure to be connected to you online. I hope you can see us and you can hear us. Good. Loud, loud and clear. Yeah, and I can hear you just as well. Good. I'm not sure you've actually participated or at least listened to the previous two sections. So just for your information, we've had artists and philosophers and the audience here seems to be enjoying the exhibition immensely. So we've been talking previously about things that changed in humans and in human boundaries, the things that separate, uh, separate us from animals and machines. In the second session, for example, we talked about how we could actually learn to think in a non-anthropocentric way. But section three, which I assume has been very much awaited by many colleagues of mine, I've actually heard them saying that the practices that can be learned in sessions like this are very often the so-called frontier practices. And they are like the golden nuggets. So we plan to share these practices with you and many of these practices you know they're not yet employed by corporations or universities or more traditional institutions and it's only natural that it is an art that we are participating in this frontier activities so i want to invite the speakers now to tell us about their understanding of dialogue and also about the communities you are going to be telling us so I think the first speaker is Daria Miller. Is this correct, Daria? Hello. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to present at a conference like this. I hope you can hear me well. And my plan today is to share with you our experience of our critical zones Observatory of Earthly Politics exhibition. I have prepared a short presentation, so please bear with me. I hope you can see it now.
And here I will share my experience in actually building common ground. So this exhibition uh, was, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it, it opened at ZKM last year. We actually had to postpone the opening by two months because of the pandemic, and we also had to extend it because of the same pandemic. That's why it's still up and running. It will be on until 9th of January 2022. So what is it about? Well, until until now, the globe has pretty much determined uh, our uh, relationship with uh, this planet. So we are showing blue marble, blue I'm sorry, blue marble here, and Earth looks like a planet, just like many others, right? And we see it from a distance. And in fact, it's a very good visual illustration of how we are treating this planet. We're treating it as if it were you know, sort of dispensable, easy to manage, and uh, not something that we are really careful about. So here, together with Breno Latour, we're inviting people to rethink the territory where we live. To think of it not of a, as not as of a blue marble or a globe, but rather as a critical zone. So it looks like a membrane or skin. It's a boundary, effectively. So it's actually a very small territory, several kilometers deep. Actually, the term critical zone comes from Earth sciences and is defined as the permeable, uh, I'm sorry, yes, the permeable layer, uh, uh, which sort of keeps breathing and keeps developing. So it contains water, air, all living animals, and they're all in continuous interaction with each other. It's a highly reactive and very fragile habitat, which uh, sort of uh, has uh, nurtured evolution, nurture life. So Bruno Latour expanded this term to include philosophy as well. So in philosophy, critical zone also includes our attitude to the world around us. And uh, obviously, we are an unprecedented threat to this planet. Now, this exhibition is looking very hard at the kind of policy we need to run in order for the Earth to stay habitable. In this slide, for example, we are showing biogeochemical bio cycles, and this one shows that, well, what we are doing is very much based on scientific knowledge, and uh, that's actually for a reason we are calling the Observatory of the Critical Zone. It's These are actually scientific observe, uh, observation stations, primarily stationed in forests, and they are tracking chemical elements entering and leaving the system. The same analysis is actually helping us identify the kind of impact humans are having on the critical zone. What's also quite interesting is that such observatories are quite cross-disciplinary. So we have, for example, uh, geochemistry, biology, geology, pedology, and, so, and, and a bunch of others remote there. So besides the knowledge of critical zone coming from scientists, in the same exhibition, we are sort of uh, learning from Alexander von, Gum uh, von Gumboldt and uh, W. Lovelock, uh, who gave us the Gaia hypothesis. Now, I will quickly skim through some photos I have here, but not that fast there. Eh? For example, what you see here is the first large installation. It's a model of a critical zone, or rather observatory of critical zone. It actually exists in a small village in Elsass, and there are different scientific stations there measuring parameters of water and snow. And this is helping us actually see nature as very dynamic. 
something that is driven by the interaction of chemical elements of organic and inorganic nature. It's also a sort of a living lab for us because it helps us develop a cross-disciplinary collaboration. Also, we're trying to understand how we can actually act outside concepts such as nature or ecology. So, slides from the exhibition will follow. It's actually a pretty large exhibition. In this exhibition, we have discovered that it was pretty difficult to translate philosophical and scientific ideas to the common parlance. And we also wanted to see how we could actually transition from philosophy and aesthetics to action. That's why we actually prepared a, a large-scale activation program where bringing together uh, local community knowledge, science, and art about becoming terrestrial, being connected to the soil, so to speak, to the land where we live. So these are, in fact, multi-faceted uh, numerous processes which define the critical zone. It's also an invitation to discuss the kind of life we want to have in the future and also an invitation to start seeing the place where we live as a critical zone. I'm showing some slides here, which uh, uh, were actually taken in the last portion of the exhibition, which borders our workshop area. Actually, we wanted to involve the local community, the associations, and to diverse clubs existing in Karlsruhe. And many of them are actually involved in adjacent subjects. So we wanted to involve them a lot in what we did. And uh, this is something that we did in a previous exhibition, something that ran between 2017 and 2019. That exhibition and that particular concept there were very successful. We had lots of programs, we had lots of events, which were organized and supported by local communities. And this actually helped us engage more experts in our program. So we gave them space. We also offered them grants. And uh, they also, I'm not sure, maybe, so it's not, I'm not entirely sure how the grants were involved, but they were also given access to our audience, to our public. Now, naturally, with the onset of Corona, we had to reshuffle our plans. Uh, lots of events we had to take digital, which actually proved to be pretty difficult with these activist groups because, you know, personal contact there actually plays a very important role. So this is how we developed this program, but I also wanted to give you another example here. Now, this is a particular work by Verle Botero. Uh, so he's a French environmentalist and engineer called Notes Towards a Permacircular Museum. The starting point for this project was whether an exhibition can actually be a space for reflection on its own carbon footprint, which is natural. Like if we are running exhibitions about uh, Gaia and the critical zone, we actually have to take this into account. We need to start reflecting on the carbon footprint of our exhibitions as such. So the starting point for us was to map the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the exhibition itself. So Stefan Verle Botero actually analyzed all the data on movements of uh, objects d'art on the travels of the artists and curators. And he also requested information about the building, and he actually produced this graph, which is also a veritable piece of the exhibition. Uh, 
So it's an invitation for us all to become more environmentally friendly. Another step in the same project, following the mapping exercise, was about compensating this carbon footprint. Now, we could have simply planted trees, but we wanted instead to do some mediation. And we also wanted to re-engineer our practices. So together with Stefan, we actually rented a fruit orchard, which is located close to ZKM. And for the next five years, the employees of uh, ZKM are going to take care of this orchard. So our idea is that we want to run various events and activities there involving and engaging the community. So far, it has been very difficult because of the COVID. And like I said, uh, we did InstaWalk and we had other digital formats. So InstaWalk did actually take place in the orchard. I should also mention here that orchards are a traditional thing in Germany. However, it's a dying form now because they are not as profitable compared to other agribusinesses. And quite naturally, you know, older breeds, uh, for example, of uh, apple trees, they actually produce uh, small crops of smaller apples. So in most cases, you will see farmers mowing them down. So our ambition with this project was to actually provide some social sustainability. And we also wanted to level the divide between the museum and the community. So we wanted to effectively take care of the orchard together with our public. So we are thinking of it as a practical space for action. The idea of this project is that we want to think about the role of a museum, not just uh, you know as an institution taking care of uh, works of art, but also as an institution taking care of non-human actors sort of spreading our care to the environment. Photos from our projects? So we had a performative action by Stefan and Charmin Bouillet before we actually did our first pruning and naturally had to start with a pruning course. So interestingly, We did it with a local organization, which is responsible for land allocation in the city. <laughs> and we also had some harvesting activities. And this summer, we actually had this beautiful exercise where we mowed grass down. And we also engaged with other communities. Now, what you see here, is the OK Lab Karlsruhe project led by Mr. Kugel. So he actually deployed sensors in this orchard that measure all sorts of things uh, such as humidity, CO2 content, and other parameters. And we're also comparing this data to data coming from sensors located very close to the museum itself. Now you can see the results of these measurements. I'm quoting from his internet page. And it's actually part of our digital platform, which forms part of the exhibition. So the, the address is uh, critical-zones.zkm.d. And we also use lots of digital formats. For example, this here is a movie about our mediator Barbara and Nelly Kempfer from some Karlsruhe authorities, a public organization, are talking about what orchards are, um, sorry, what meadows are, what kind of biodiversity they support, and 
species of trees you can find there and so on. This is our workshop space where we actually wanted to engage local communities, but uh, you know, then uh, COVID struck. And this is a list of our partners, such as Parents for a Future, Consume Global Cars Through a Greenpeace, and so on. So diverse organizations. And naturally, the list of our partners is much longer. What you see here is photos from an activity we uh, we ran together with the Klima Collective of Karlsruhe. It was part of the global climate strike. Please note that all these posters have been printed with the algae ink. So we also organize workshops and various activities. So this one, for example, is a workshop on how to be terrestrial. And this was a hybrid uh, firm lab. So we had participants online and offline who learned how to ferment vegetables in order to make kombucha, for example. Thanks for your attention. And Urash, if you're going to be next, do not talk as fast as Darya did, please. So, I've got, uh, right away, I've got uh, several questions for a clarification. So, what kind of communities have you engaged and which particular communities was it easier to engage? Was there, you know, some good response from some communities, but not the others? And my second question, is about Museum of the Future. I'm guessing that Zach KM must have thought about it and reflected on it quite a lot. Do you have any specific ideas on what makes a Museum of the Future in terms of interaction with communities? Yeah, I have mentioned already that dealing with the, this uh, communities must have been uh, very difficult because uh, they really require face-to-face -face meetings. It has been an uphill battle. We are trying to catch up now. I, I can actually tell you that uh, they got involved quite easily, but then, you know, we had disagreements and some groups, for example, wanted to have more activities than we were prepared to run. And we felt that we could not live up to their expectations. Well, for example, artists for future. Uh, we had a roller coaster right with them, but there were others. For example, there was an organization. I'm trying to interpret from German to English first. So uh, they are doing. Uh, environmental protection and we had to talk about environment we actually had a great uh, joint project with the greenpeace involving school kids so we asked school kids to tell us how they analyze their carbon footprints and what kind of measures they take in order to minimize their footprints now this is it about community have you involved scientific communities? I don't know, environmentalists, for example, ecologists, for lack of a better word. Actually, we did not have an objective of engaging them, but we did involve them as we prepared the exhibition. The idea of the activation program was to spread the scientific knowledge already accumulated inside the exhibition. So I wanted to make it easily available to the people. That's why we actually did not target scientific communities as such. In a digital space, there is a format called Terrestrial University. It's a series of experimental lectures we run together with scientists 
and artists. Naturally, in this format, we have engaged both artists and scientists. But that's more of an experimental format. Thank you very much. Uh, what about the museum? Because I believe it's one of the key questions for all the museums of the world. Things are changing, right? How is uh, your museum going to change? Because many museums now want to engage the audience much more than before. And the big question is, how do you do that? How do you empower people to participate in our projects? Here, I really want to quote our creative director who for the open codes exhibition said, let's see the museum as a community of people, not as a community of objects. So it's not a community, but assembly, as you must have heard, which is exactly our ambition here. So we are trying to find ways of uh, ensuring participation of our public. So we want to engage them in practical activities. The way I see it, the Museum of the Future is participatory, but also permacircular. So this is an idea from Stefan, which I mentioned previously. A museum like this is very much aware of its impact and uh, tries to make sure that it minimizes its carbon footprint. Which means like it's aware of its carbon footprint and it actively works towards compensating and minimizing it. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. And now I think we should turn to Urash. Okay, thank you. Hello. Um, um, I think I think I I can just share a screen. Oh, let's see. Yeah, why not? Let's do that. Um, well, I think it's this way is better. Hmm. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Oh, okay. Very good. good. Excellent. Um, so I I wanted to focus more on kind of presenting what we do. I am not a curator, um, or at least I don't curate much. Um, I'm not an artist for some time now. And um, what I want to approach this is more like how do we how do we sustain how do we facilitate how do we develop communities and mostly what I'm going to think about is not what was maybe the previous sessions which was very much about the communities with others with the non-humans but also more about how do we make the artworks that really that we do that deal with exactly what we've been talking about and maybe that have been dealing with the art um, production in the let's say from the new media era to the um, let's say post-human era of um, of today um, in terms of contemporary art um, when when it comes to art technology and science so we are Priktatol, uh, which is it is an organization that has started in hmm, 92 and formerly 94 started by Marco Pilchan, Pilchan, and it is basically an art, technology, and science-oriented um, NGO. Um, we produce artworks that, are in, that have been shown in, across biennales uh, across the world. This one, um, is, well, I should have taken the one from the Venice Biennale. This is the famous Macro Lab, um, um, but also we, do, we work with um, artists like Yasmina Tsibitz recently, um, that does, let's say, this kind of theater performative um, visual artworks. And, um, and we basically, what we mostly do is we, we, we focus more on the development and production of art more than on, let's say, presentation of it, which is more, let's say, um, kind of we see as museums and galleries roles. Um, and it's a quite an interdisciplinary approach. I think this 
piece has been talked about and um, since Sasha is also um, part of the exhibition, um, Sasha explained about it and this has been also co-produced by us. And it, um, so we're dealing, yeah, with, let's say, art that is, that deals with the ecosystems, with infrastructures and communities. Let's, let's say that, that is kind of our topical focus. Um, one of the cases here is um, also the Arctic Perspective Initiative, which deals with the um, peoples of the, um, the north, um, northern regions, let's say in the circumpolar region across, I mean, on top of the globe. Um, but then we also deal with, let's say, less spectacular works or less, um, or, you know, also works that work in public space, um, develop, um, let's say, um, Phone apps. This is just a take from a, um, from an opening that we did um, two days ago, of a, of a public installation that basically lives in a in in a phone app, um, and it's what and we did like a sound intervention um, just recently. What our organization also does, um, also they also have, and this is just a side note, also a music label. Um, and so we also do music events, mostly on, let's say, um, electronic um, and hip hop based music, but let's say on more on the abstract end. So indeed a very inter interdisciplinary um, um, production. And I don't think I need to go into one particular piece. Um, one other thing, which is very strong, uh, with us, especially for the last five years, or let's say, let's say, let's say 10 years, it's we do a lot of workshops. We really work with the community and we really want to develop that. So there, there is a strong, let's say, this maker DIY um, part of our work. Um, and the most important part of it is doing things together or let's say doing it with others. Um, so well, this is one of the um, COVID times uh, workshops we needed to go outside. Um, and this is this was done in the summer. Um, even though I mentioned that I, we focus mostly on production of art, we also co-share a presentation space and a development space. It's called the SMOSA. Um, and we share it with the LAC Institute. Um, some of you might know Dragan Zhivadino working mostly, especially when, when, when he's in Russia, on let's say this, um, um, how do you call it, um, culturalization of space, um, more or less in terms of theater. Um, and then Mila Art and Science Lab, our dear close partners, uh, which we share our activities with, and then there's us. And Osmosa is a presentation project space. Um, so we do things from micro theater performances, like small performances for less than 50 people, um, a lot of exhibitions, and there's a lot of workshops. Um, we also have residency studios because we do host a lot of um, resident artists, especially from outside of Slovenia, because Slovenia is a small country anyway. Um, I think that's very important for our, let's say, for the fabric of our, our production. Um, there's a workshop space which um, which is let's say a hardware workshop and also um, a, a software workshop what we have and there's office spaces so that's all in the, in in one floor of let's say a, a high rise um, in the center of Ljubljana um, so yeah um, so I guess I mean for the last let's say how long well, since 90s, um, well, it's going to be 30 years soon that we exist. Um, so uh, today I want to focus more or just kind of give a, a start um, in terms of how we think of our, what I said before, like what is our role in the society in producing all this art? And and there's, there's, there's let's say there, there could be multiple angles to this, but um, I, I think I could focus, let's say, on one here, um, but just want to cross it over with the other one. So let's say that there is a vertical, um, there is one vertical um, pillar, um, which is we try to work with all the generations, especially lately. We have started to work with kids as well. So we do workshops, um, which is important because um, basically the school system is not covering that. So this kind of art and science and art and technology um, we figured out 
that we will need to raise the kids that you know if we want to keep going um, as strong as we are now in the future i mean i think this kind of art that we are dealing with is across europe kind of becoming the mainstream but to be fair um we are dealing with let's say very hmm, well, the, the school system is not very employed for that. And we're working with, let's say, all, also the artists and, and other makers and community members coming from all kind of, let's say, skill levels, from the experts to, let's say, this kind of middle levels to total beginners. We want to be inclusive as possible. But today I want to talk more about, let's say, one perspective of the activities that we do. And they are more like about the horizontal connections. And I mentioned before about Osmosa, which is one case of that, so that we co-share a space with other organizations that might, we might not agree all the time with, with their, let's say, how they do things, but it is so important to basically kind of keep each other close and work with each other and, and, and to, to basically negotiate that, and it's a big um, process. Um, but one other thing that I want to present here is our PIF camp um, and we, I've, mentioned, I've mentioned Sasha before and she was part of the previous session she was also part of the PIF camp not this year but last year when we had this kind of a COVID reduced one was it I think last year or the year before um, and this is um, now we are going to run it next year for the eighth time we do it every year it's a seven day kind of hacker base about art, science, and technology. We co-run it with Lyudmila. Um, also a big partner is Kersnikova, and it's Asperic Tatol. And it's basically an international community that we bring um, into the Alps. Um, and it deals with DIY electronics, food hacking, so fermenting, fermenting wild edibles, um, kind of foraging even. Um, e-textiles, wearables that are also important there, digital art definitely um, in, in all kinds um, all kinds of coding, music always finds its way in and let's say this environmental sciences, bio art um, or the legacy of bio art, but also we don't shy away from crafts um, and we also always include um, humanities, social sciences and it, it's got to do all, it's all got to do with um, DIY doing it with others um, doing it together kind of um, way of doing things so it's a this kind of a collaborative creating working environment full of kind of workshops of um, practical field trips of tactical field trips um, lectures theoretic lectures briefings um, just kind of lead-ins um, for people who are maybe not skilled in something very basic um, for some other people, some experts on, let's say, in electronics, um, and you want to kind of teach the people um, that. Um, so it's basically about collaboration and kind of creative working and co-working. Um, it's set in uh, this Triglau National Park in Slovenia. Um, we do it every August. Uh, usually first or second week of August. And, and that's a big, big part of it. So to be outside, not to be in one of our cities and locked in. And, and yeah, basically nature plays a big part of it. So these are all our beef campers just chilling in a maybe 10 degrees centigrade river, even diving into it briefly. Um, so basically it's a place where people come from all across, let's say, the globe and connect. Um, and so we, we always have, I, I would say, more than 10 nationalities coming in. A big chunk of them are, of course, Slovenians, just because the team is also that big. Um, but the point is that we kind of leave our studios, our labs, our co-working spaces, our, our offices, and do and develop things together. Um, for for a week and work and explore and work do the field trips and work together um so people come some get invited some are we asked hey please apply um there's a big team um part of it as well but um 
mostly there's people applying through an application through an open call and then we kind of curate who we um, who we um, select um, in terms of the projects that they propose but after that um, the program of PIF camp really is all about hmm, self-assembly um, this is a this this poster is basically what the participants did just kind of an, on a closing night and there is like a lot of things coming together what we as organizers provide only after we select the participants is basically the roof over their head um, food which is very important good food basically equals good mood and and that's you know we just make sure that the food is amazing and that everybody is happy and we provide basic lab tools um some minor let's say very basic codes of conduct just kind of don't 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 kill the squirrels something like that um in there and um and also some let's say non non-technical non-geeky activities um which is let's go for a hike um on let's say the one of the days um, so we kind of want to have everybody moving and enjoying the countryside even though um, a lot of these people are very much technology um, let's say um, immersed in their technology or in their projects and after that it's basically a dive into it and it's what it becomes for participants usually what we hear is it becomes very overwhelming there is too much things going on so um so uh, here on the upper right corner, you can see the um, being overwhelmed by her own project, but there's just too many things happening, even though it's about 60 people usually, um, it's impossible to follow what everybody's doing. And people actually engage in terms of, um, I would say at least one third of people who come with a project kind of leave their project aside and basically join other people or get lost in that. And this is the best thing that actually we like about it. It's basically you can go and 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 do the forages um, and do the hikes and you can we can have um, musicians working with e-textiles and wearable experts. Um, there's a lot of fermenting and tasting going on. Um, uh, there is um, there is um, sometimes there are this kind of soldering um, swatch shops almost um, situations where everybody gets crazy about soldering some um, new gadget and um, and we also try to share this um, as open as possible and create video tutorials manuals and report on the things that have been developed there even though we don't ask anybody to develop an artwork or or anything we we just ask everybody just to kind of engage and it's basically everybody's kind of yeah underslept after a week of that uh, this is one of the things which i like as an organizer um that we even when we talk about let's say kind of maintaining the community identity and 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 if you want to say marketing in very very kind of 90s terms there is there's things that that just kind of run on their own um, and just you know, we just put stickers there, and the and the the kombuchas and the beers that were brewed at beef camp will automatically get a sticker on the bottles, and we'll taste them a, a year later maybe. And if there is a silk screen workshop, people will start doing their own T-shirts, and will be ambassadors of beef camp um, long after. And we get even more amazing participants um, over the next few years. Um, and also there is like a meme channel. So there's like a lot of internal communication. So there's a really good spirits there. Um, yeah, so basically it's what we consider it, it's, it's like a hotbed or a test bed for, for, uh, for projects that we might be doing over the next few years or our organizations, not only Projekt Atol, maybe Ludmila is one of the co um, co-founders or Kersnikova also as kind of a member of the team as well um, and it's very unpredictable um, on the upper left there is one of the pieces that got later developed by Sasha Spachal that kind of was co-developed there um, and let's say on the 
on the let's say the middle white picture is one of the sensors which we are now spinning off hopefully within a year it's gonna it might even become a company for a product that basically also got co-started on the PIF camp um, as kind of a, a sensor device, which is now in, in very strong development and working with our local community. Basically, as we speak, um, there are workshops um, on kind of development and testing the, the, the first um, modules um, that we're building. Um, so, yeah, it's basically where we also test what we do um, in the next few years or the, the projects we're developing, are co-developing and they're taking new turns when they come to PIFCAM. And then we took a step further um, and organized the Feral Labs network, which was with other EU um, partners because this was co-founded by the Creative Europe um, strand. Um, so we, we also who we kind of joined with uh, BioArt Society um, from Finland, Schmiede, from Austria, Radiona, uh, from Croatia, Catch, uh, from Denmark, Makery, the French magazine, on online magazine, and us. And each of us, us does something um, like that and something that we then called as a format, in theory, a feral lab. And I'll just briefly, because I know I'm running late now, go through what feral labs are. We kind of see them as this temporary interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary um, events um, from philosophy to makers to hackers, thinkers, citizen science, essay writers, digital and environmental activists, um, and, and also, you know, all kinds of science. Um, they're also mixing, but I think that's a tourism anyway for science and art plus science field anyway. Um, so you know that's one of the fertile grounds um and what is what we have in common is also we really subscribe to this open and free culture in terms of um open software free software libra software um and and not that we just use these tools but we really 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 try to also pay back because an, as artists a lot of the times we use these technologies, but then we don't produce the documentation so other people could use our code or um, but just basically hacks that were developed. So here we can see Vatsla recording that kind of a session. So it goes online and then gets shared on, the, on YouTube, even if, it's, if that's the best place to put it, if it's not GitHub or Thingiverse or wherever you want to upload it. What is super important for us is also that there's they create this kind of communal isolation. So being remote, doing field work, being situated, if we want to use the Donna Haraway terms a bit, um, that's also that's also super important for us to that you know people become kind of trapped. So you can't basically go back to the office or for just a brief hundred like half an hour on one hour meeting. You need to be away from where you usually work. Um, that basically creates the community, the communal. This is kind of the social engineering part of what we do. And then if we have a scientist on board, you know, they cannot escape us. They need to engage uh, within the community or a, or a technologist. Um, and then they're temporary. They're, this kind of transience is very, very important, actually, to kind of create this kind of heterotopic part. This picture is repeating because it's also so amazing who wants to work like this all the time, like being cramped, soldering, I guess nobody. Um, but then it's super exciting um, if you do it for, you know, just a week or so. So this kind of heterotopic social engineering is social, quite important for us. And this is basically what, what we do, how we do things within the feral labs and within, with beef camp. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, the conclusions I just want to say basically, and I think that was also the previous discussions as well, is basically when you say feral labs, you know, the lab is kind of this super structured, clean, you know, predictable system, um, kind of also feels a bit one dimensional. 
And we really want to invest also in making things also a bit more feral, a bit more visceral. Um, and then if you just do some basic things, you, pick, you bring people together, you know, you make them feel good, comfortable, good about themselves, the environment, the other people they're with. Um, you don't really need to tell them what to do and amazing things will happen, like crazy, crazy projects, uh, which are a great feed for our next um, artworks that we're going to produce or somebody else might or they might. And there's also great connections. So basically, I mean, if you want to create art, it's too complex to control it and you basically have to let go. And you can only do small, small interventions, possibly the way they're perceived, they're kind of invisible. You serve food at a certain hour, and that also creates structure somehow. And then you get this kind of self-driven breakthrough, lost in the original plan processes, which, which just become crazy, amazing, um, you know, because feral is the unpredictable, untamed, kind of doesn't fit into the system. Um, yeah. Let, I think this is more than enough for now. Oh, thank you so much, Urish. Let me ask you a couple of questions right away. And I understand that Alexey has a question as well. I am aware that we have uh, limited time. We only have some like 45 minutes left until the very end of the day. And I was wondering if I was going to make a speech and after I've heard your speech, I realized I absolutely wanted to share my methodology, which means we still have two more presentations to listen to. My first sort of instant comment is that what you have shown is indeed a spectacular process. You know, in our lab, Art and Science Laboratory, for many years, we've been trying to develop a process, process of interaction for scientists and artists, and we also have an incubator program. And I'll try to show it in some schematics I have. But I'm saying that this process is a kind of a luxury process because well, people usually expect a result from us, something that can be presented at an exhibition or elsewhere. Uh, so where I'm leading this? Oh, right. The science art that we are discussing today is certainly so much more than simply art. It is so much more than just exhibition art. We're not just doing exhibitions here, even if... Uh, you know, even if we are producing some technologically challenging things like Project Atoll does, actually Project Atoll, from what I know, is the oldest institution globally involved in this line of business. So we are developing, we're nurturing this very special interactions of different communities and institutions. It's an extremely important function we perform. And just like Zach I am, which is actually a huge museum. Uh, Dari can actually tell you how big they are, how many employees they have. And I guess that Project Atoll is more similar to uh, our laboratory because it's also a non-profit small project. But I believe it's a very difficult and a very important function of our institutions. I've been thinking here about uh, uh, Marco Pelham's uh, project, uh, who's the founder of uh, a project at all, the CDPDU. I actually even have it in my slides. So in this project, he showed how he engaged the indigenous people of the Arctic. And I wanted to, you know, touch this subject briefly. because we're exploring here new ways of communicating with others, including non-human others. In that project of Marco, as well as some other projects, involving indigenous people,
well, you know, indigenous people, they interact with animals and inanimate objects at a totally different level, a level we usually do not instantly think of because our our tribe, so to speak, has forgotten it. Now, we went to the Altai Mountains recently and we noticed that the locals often speak a special language to the horses and they have special practices of venerating the sun and the river. They're speaking a special language and I guess we have lost such languages in our ethnic groups, but they still remember them. So I find it very interesting. And I believe that such communities are extremely interesting. So I would love to share our methodology. I hope I'll get enough time to talk about it. But here I need to hand it over to Alexei. I understand that Alexei, I'm sorry, Urish. You know, I wanted to ask you a question, but somehow it turned into a comment. But I will have questions later. And also, I want to use this opportunity to thank you for your partnership in uh, pulling off this project. I'm referring to Earthlink by Sasha Spachal. It's so special, really. I'm not sure you've witnessed the previous discussion where we actually said that this exhibition is extremely popular and people are enjoying the exhibition as such and this project in particular so i hand it over to alexei and i understand that you have a question first and then there is a presentation hi i just wanted to note that presentations so speeches by dasha and urush are showing kind of a conflict because Urish is working with a global community while Dasha is focusing obviously on the very local community around the museum, right? Well, because uh, uh, she's uh, obviously very concerned about uh, her museum's impact. So my question is like this. Are you considering changing focus? Are you considering focusing on more local communities, Urush? Uh, are you considering working with communities which have proved to have strong internal links, as opposed to bringing people who don't know each other from all over the world? I, I can certainly relate to what artistic isolation is, I know the artistic residency is a great tool. I do not doubt the artistic benefits it can provide. But what about the local communities? They seem to be on the verge of extinction. Aren't they important? So do you have any projects around them? Thank you. Um, well, th thank you for the comment. And, um, and of course, um, we are working with the local communities more and more. Um, so there's, when we mentioned, when I mentioned that we're working in Osmosa, their workshopology part obviously caters to the local communities. When we, when I said that I wanted to talk about the, um, not just the local communities in terms of, let's say the adult communities, but we also want to, let's say, grow our own communities not just for ourselves, but also for the other Ljubljana's art and science, art and technology um, spaces, organizations, because there's plenty of us in, here in Ljubljana um, and we want to work with kids. So indeed, um, we have been working, especially for the last few years, a lot um, on developing more and more. And, and you know, actually, um, if I was talking about Feral Labs and PIF Camp today, even might have been better that Tina, my dear colleague, should have actually, who is kind of the head of um, the work, the, the let's say this kind of DIY, doing it with others um, uh, programs, should have been maybe even a better suitable person to do, to do this um, presentation. 
and she is all about running this um, local community. So we 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 work with local communities on various levels, either with kids, or we work with them. And I showed the the little gadget that we're building, and that could be a local community-based business. Uh, what we're actually trying to to for the first time to 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 explore. How do we do that? Um, so I think it needs to be a, always a good mix of the local and let's say the cosmopolitan. Um, it, 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 and, you know, and this um, working with the, making a PIF camp was basically based on also the thinking of that we should, you know, support the, you know, whatever the local labs and communities are they also need to kind of mix and, and have this kind of peer-to-peer in-person physical exchange of knowledge and skills and thinking um, in one space. So I think this is more as an add-on to the, to the local communities. And um, if nobody else is doing it, we will do it. But if everybody else is doing it, it won't stop us doing, you know, also investing in that, especially lately, this has been a big part of our um, local identity. Um, so it, there, I don't see any dichotomy. I basically just focus on something a bit different at this point. Um, thank you very much for your answer. Indeed, there are other interesting things. Well, there is this issue of uh, ferality. You can say it's a sort of a, you know, catastrophic uh, sign of the current era, of the Cthulhu scene. You know, we have domesticated lots and lots of animal species and many of them proved to be unnecessary now now they've gone wild they've gone feral take for example pigeons and you can actually start my presentation in the meanwhile so pigeons are in fact companions of agriculturalists, you know, they used to play a very important role for settled people. And they were also used a lot for sacrifices. You know, people would sacrifice lots of pigeons. Check your Bible if you don't remember it. But now they are effectively an invasion. So from virality, to invasion, it's such a short step. I want to touch upon this subject as well. And uh, I have uh, an urban fauna lab. And what we say we are developing a uh, host parasites arms or race tools so if you've taken an interest in evolutionary biology you certainly know the model it's actually a huge cloud of meanings but most of the meanings are sort of negative the word parasite itself comes from the classical literature tradition, from Greek satire, if I'm not mistaken. In fact, etymologically speaking, a parasite was a cl clergyman who would actually collect uh, taxes on the users of... Uh, Was that uh, temple land? Ah. 
I'm not going to show my works. Instead, I'm showing, so to speak, work in progress. Because he can easily check out my works on the website, there is a PDF there. But over the 10 years I've been doing it, I've collected lots and lots of illustrations from my interactions with the community. Now these people band together in, in order to, to help, you know, this uh, feral species in the cities, primarily pigeons and cats. Most of the cities I've been to in Russia and abroad, I talk to these people. Now what they're doing may seem absurd. They are adults, they're actually spending a lot of time and a lot of resources in order to support in invasive species. Species which uh, are often antagonistic to humans. Quite often. These are, for example, old cats whom nobody wants to adopt or sick animals. Or it could be what I call pigeon pastures. In, a, in any big city, you can actually find this and they're like an altar. And, you know, people go there and they feed these pigeons as if offering a sacrifice. I, I've got a whole collection of these very telling photos and I can tell you stories about each and every person there. This is Taipei. So this is a woman who established a cat village in Taipei in the place of an abandoned coal mine. That's a well-known dude in San Francisco. So he, he passed away last year. He actually published a newspaper called Agent World. So the mythopoetic context uh, these people create is spectacular. You know, each of them has uh, explanations for why they do it. And there is a lot of animism, there is a lot of archaic stuff there. So you can see the swan there and whatnot. And the swan, this uh, dude you see in the previous picture, he actually outdid everybody. Now he actually wrote in his pamphlets that he is Buddha and Jesus Christ incarnate. And what people get in return is the marks like this. This is New Delhi. See, it's a business there. People are selling pigeon feed there. So people arrive in their cars, they buy pigeon feed and they feed the pigeons. And this is something I've been looking at, not as a researching, for many years. I'm actually trying to establish what stimulates people to this sort of behavior. I would love to show a kind of symmetry between care or violence as humans build relations with animals. It's an important element in so many religions and mythologies. You know, the moment when people stopped human sacrifices and instead started sacrificing animals. Uh, 
So, in the Book of Things, they actually mention human uh, human sacrifices as you know a bad sign of habit. And you can also think of Agamemnon, who was about to sacrifice his daughter, but eventually went for a deer. Same happens to Abraham. So you remember that Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. He was told that sacrificing is important, but son is uh, this sort of not dispensable. So. Um, a sheep will do instead. So I'm wondering why sacrifices and Lucretius in his poem on the nature of things asks this question, which I believe is actually a very important piece for uh, science and art, because Lucretius He, uh, he actually provided us with the earliest description of an atomary structure of the world. So he said that things were not holistic. He actually said that while things consist of very small particles you cannot see, nor can you sort of research them, but you know, they are there and they are sort of chaotically moving in a vacuum. So in this poem, he described it all and precise sciences, you know, STEM sciences, have been actually studying it since then. He didn't use terms for it, he used imagery. But, you know, this imagery persisted until the 19th century. You know, the chaos theory, uh, dynamic systems, open systems, you know, all the com constituent elements of these theories, you can in fact find in the works of Lucretius. Post-anthropocentric discussion we are hearing is in fact nothing new. I actually don't see it as anything progressive. Quite the contrary, I see it as realization that some archaic modes of thinking are in fact relevant. You know, and they were very prominent even before Christianity, well before Christianity. You know, these ideas of chaos and vacuum and the general randomness of life and general disillusionment and general confusion in front of uh, nature. All this you can find in Lucretius. And actually he quotes from Epicurus. Funnily enough, it became very relevant only in the 20th century. Last thing I wanna say, the word vacuum which Lucretius actually brings into this world. And he does claim that the world is a vacuum and like uh, dust particles in uh, the rays of uh, the sun, you know, atoms are born by the winds. Vacuum is close to vacare, which means to cleanse. And cleansing is in fact a sort of catharsis, which means that vacuum is indeed pretty close to catharsis and sacrifice. So we will sacrifice in order to experience catharsis. And very often we won't understand why we're doing that. It's because something is there in vacuum. Yeah, it's, it's quite an arc from pigeons to Lucretius. What can art do in a vacuum? Well, art, let me put it differently. Lucretius tried to explain how things are created randomly, like a random turbulent flow brings things into existence. 
this is how complexity gets created. You know, atoms bump against each other and here you have a Gothic cathedral. In fact, it was his critique of religious superstitions very prevalent in his time because, you know, they kept sacrificing obsessively. You know, they had this obsessive compulsive disorder with rituals. But still, he actually starts with a prayer to Venus, although it's a, an anti-religion treatise he is producing. You know, art always hides something. Art is a kind of a beautiful tombstone. And what do you have under this tombstone? It could be an ancestor or a cyclops. You know, all the artists here have already mentioned, you know, the randomness or the unfathomability, or if you like, the murmuration of matter. In fact, they were talking about the divine. which in my opinion is a religious practice. What I'm doing here is not is not very artistic, I guess. Okay, and as an artist, how do you see your role in this interspecies dialogue? A an artist is somebody who sacrifices a proverbial deer instead of a human but you know in the 21st century we obviously should frown upon a deer you know there are obviously in art uh, there are attempts to actually zeroize catharsis completely like the black square but this attempt you know i guess uh, they quell all types of aggression or any in fact any other emotion or you can switch your ratio and force people to spend time doing research for example oh, it's very interesting alexei thank you very much i'm just concerned we have little time because we'll need to start wrapping up very soon urish daria do you have any questions for alexei right away Not yet. Okay, if this is the case, please bear with me. I should be able to tell it in much more detail next time. But I want to use this opportunity to tell you about our experience in terms of dealing with local communities. Here I'm referring to the community of artists, scientists and engineers. I'm sorry. And I need my presentation now. I have so many questions for the speakers and I so badly want to see Museum of the Future and she's obviously quoting our beloved Peter Weibel that it's a, how did you put it? It not an assembly of objects, but rather an assembly of people, right? And people come there to create I certainly hope that non-human agents will also be involved in that. I am not sure Weibel actually mentioned that. Well, this is something we actually try to achieve with our projects, the one with the orchard. So this is how we wanted to include the non-human actors. Well, I hope that in the not so distant future, it is going to happen. I think that Museum of the Future will feature artificial intelligence, plants, or maybe even viruses. Can you please click my slides? I'll be very specific, right? Now, for those who don't know the know my laboratory, very quickly, very briefly, 
Since 2008, we've been building a platform, if you like, a community of uh, scientists, artists and engineers. And Laboratoria is an initiative of curators. So we also form a sub-community. Now, these are the slides illustrating the first years of our work. So you see what we do is full immersion of scientists in, I'm sorry, of artists in scientific labs. This has actually been my big dream from the very beginning, enabling artists to understand real science by observing it rather than reading books or watching movies through direct collaboration, direct, uh, uh, direct engagement. It could be engaged observation or maybe participation in laboratory experiments. So since 2008, we've been doing that. And for example, we put uh, artists in the material science lab at Moscow Institute of Steel and Steel Alloys. So back then, everybody was raving about nanotechnologies. Actually, we have explored lots of things over these years, simply following the frontiers of science. For example, in 2015, we ran a project around uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And back then, it was very new. Quantum technologies, genetic modifications, artificial intelligence. Now, what you see here, I'm not sure you can make it out, but we have Konstantin Anokhin there and Mikhail Burtsev. They are some of the most important scientists in this country doing neuroscience. And in this central discussion, you know, they are talking to some well-known Moscow-based scientists such as Shutev, Kovina, Natasha Zentsova. So these meetings, these get-togethers of people who don't know each other, who obviously speak different languages, who have very different goals. So our main method, I think it's called residency. And this is how we connect these communities. Here you should be able to see four groups. These are a laboratory, a technical experts, scientists, and artists. And note, this is actually very special of us. From the very beginning, we try to develop a very synchronized relationship between them. It's not that, you know, the artist should get all the benefits of this collaboration. No. From the very beginning, I really care about scientists getting their fair share as well. They should also be benefiting from it all. So I have this desire to create mutually enriching experiences. And this is what has brought me to develop this methodology. So you see arrows pointing in pretty much every direction. And naturally, I can spend a lot of time describing it. And there is, in fact, a whole article illustrating this methodology and how to apply it. In a very simplified way, though, I can say that the most important thing that artists provide scientists with is certainly not design, but rather critical review of what they do and they get objective knowledge in return. And there are also lots of side effects here resulting from this interaction. For example, uh, not improvisation, but I'm, I have some change in science, I'm sorry, it wasn't audible. Just to give you a couple of examples. As I was listening to Urish's uh, presentation, I had a feeling that it's indeed so great when you have the opportunity to work for a long time. 
and such incubation of science and art collaboration is sometimes possible, sometimes not. And I'm stressing a particular project called Borgi and Bess. We ran it at the Kurchatov University with an Austrian artist. So we had this opportunity because we left our previous home and until we settled here at Tretikovka, we did not have a dedicated place. So we were able to continue working through incubation programs. I'm showing some slides here illustrating this lengthy process. So he's not a Russian artist, he lives in Austria. He would fly in several times and we try to immerse him as much as possible in the research performed by the Neurosciences Department of Kurchatov Institute. So you see both the scientists and the artists here in the same photo. I think the secret souls to this real relationship, and I guess that Daria and Durish know it very well as practitioners, so much really depends on having trust and having, you know, a high level of uh, respect. So, for example, the artist here will talk about his works and after we implant them in laboratories, we usually have a brainstorming session where we involve linguists and uh, philosophers and anthropologists and so the artist will share his first impression and his vision of his project and i find it very important to make sure that there is a symmetry between the scientist and the artist i believe it's very important for the scientist to have an emotional response to the project actually with borgi and bis there was a very long production procedure actually very often we run conferences which are different from what we have today because this conference sort of closing the exhibition but very often instead we run a conference before the exhibition starts in order to better understand what it is we are creating and where we want to get so this one is about demons in the machine or demons ex machine i'm not sure what the name was so oh demons from the machine right so we did it together with the british school of design and we did this conference about six months before the exhibition was opened so it was about machine learning and ai as seen by artists a weak ai let me stress this so this conference was held six months before the exhibition and it helped us with launching Borgi and Bess. So these are two robotic lamps which speak the language of Dostoevsky to each other. They are indeed speaking, they are discussing the news. They are not pre-programmed by humans to say specific phrases, no and there is also a certain choreography of movements which depends on the emotions they are actually experiencing so we brought together the community of neuroscientists robotics engineers and software developers we have them all in these photos so these communities have never collaborated before but it was a surprising idea you know, we wanted these old lamps to start speaking, to start speaking the language of Dostoevsky, and we also wanted to equip them with all the latest technologies of uh, neuro, uh, I'm sorry, of um, natural language processing and AI. So this is the kind of project we pulled off and it is very exemplary of our methodology i'm afraid i have very little time left i also want to tell you about another methodology actually for urish personally i'm showing it in english 
So uh, this is the third order observation method. And by the way, I never theorize about my methodologies. This is something I conceived during my expedition to the Arctic. I was really lucky to be invited to Spitsbergen. So we took this uh, old little schooner and there were 27 people on it, scientists and artists. The objective of the exhibition was to actually discover what's actually happening to the climate on our planet and most importantly well to find a way to talk about it on our schooner we had glaciologists oceanologists biologists each had his own tools to study the environment to study the glaciers or the sea flows or sea temperature or salinity well, the biologist continuously took water samples in order to find certain plankton. So everybody was involved in their own thing. As a curator, I was invited to participate in this expedition. I experimented and I realized that it's actually a great methodology for science art needs. technological art or whatever you call it so first order observation is observing the phenomenon and this is what a scientist is doing and you can actually see it in the schematic a scientist is observing subject of study which makes first order observation an artist doesn't have this kind of equipment And therefore, an artist cannot really observe the same subject. But he sees this data through the lens of the scientist, which makes him a second order observer. So in this expedition, I was able to start the so-called third order observation in my role as a curator. I noticed that, in fact, lots of artists would actually observe scientists' work, but they wouldn't provide them with feedback. For example, in this expedition, I had a great artist named Leonid Tishkov. Very carefully, he would watch the measurements of glaciers. And a glaciologist would say, now this glacier is gone. And Leonid would make his conclusion that the planet is dying. And when I told him, well, how about we discuss it with glaciologists? Maybe you misconstrue it. And what the glaciologist may actually think about the new work of art conceived by Leonid. And it turned out that the melting of the glacier that really struck Leonid was actually perfectly normal. You know, all the projects which we produced after this particular exhibition, in all these projects, we try to make sure we provide feedback and we get feedback. So third order observation is only possible when there is a feedback loop between the second order observer and the first order observer. So in this exhibition, post-expedition, I actually collected some other, uh, some other interesting projects. And this is uh, where we actually have this work by Marka Pelihan. So he created a special device which can actually help people in expeditions assess the state of the ice now as a person who was in an expedition like this i can assure you that this is critically important knowledge because any minute a wind direction can change and ice can easily crack your schooner now people are telling me i should wrap up so i'm wrapping up um, 
I only have one observation to make about bringing together diverse communities, such as the community of engineers and artists and scientists. In an ideal world, in a blue sky world, you know, when they're all together in the same schooner in an expedition, they've got no way of hiding from each other, right? They have to communicate, you know, they spend a whole month together. You know, they do field trips together and they live together. It's obviously a unique situation of very honest, very authentic communication of very diverse people. How do we create such conditions? And this is, in fact, my conclusion following 13 years of work in laboratoria. My conclusion is like this. Productive collaboration between an artist and a scientist or an engineer really requires quite a lot of support from an artistic institution. Without such a support, it rarely flourishes. And this, in fact, triggers the question of uh, what we believe uh, will sort of ensure future collaborations like this and what can be their products in the future. Will it simply be objet d'art? I know, for example, but in the West, for example, in Denmark, and I recently talked to my Danish colleagues, and it turned out that their interdisciplinary practices are very different from Russian ones. They care a lot about this relationship being, you know, very hands-on, very pragmatic. So artists get implanted in factories and they try to address existing social issues. I was very much carried away by this idea. I do believe that modern artists and institutions like ours, they can do so much more than just creating beautiful pieces of art. They can actually address some serious problems, which, uh, you know, other institutions may be not as well equipped to deal with. Now, Alexei is asking me what kind of problems they can address. Well, how about reprofiling factories? How about... Are you serious about that? I mean, it's good that there are lots of opportunities, but are they really equipped to do it? Are you saying it's utopian? No, I'm saying that they can potentially find new ideas maybe for new products, like it's a carpet plant, maybe producing carpets with totally outdated designs. So, you know, they can invite designers or artists who can actually, I'm, I'm just inventing here, I'm simply looking at the carpet under my feet here actually, but maybe they can come up with something that will be particularly relevant for this particular factory. Yes. You know what, that's why they actually invented the academy, the, ac the academy. You know, they acquire the right skills and they also know the history of art. And they will also be able to tell about the crashes. Now when the academy is no more, most of the work is done in groups like this. You know, when people from all over the world get together for a couple of weeks and you know there are boys and girls there which also provides some pepper you know they solder things together they jump into icy cold mountain rivers you know i've been to places like this a lot and i can assure you that uh, you know you make friends there and you stay friends with these people for years there is some cross-pollination happening there for sure So there is some transfer of ideas, no doubt about that. 
but claiming he can actually address some complex problems? I'm optimistic. Do you have a problem with that? I do hope we can actually address problems. Okay, I'm told time is up. But you know what? I still want to see Urash and Daria and check if they have questions. Or maybe we have questions for them. Or maybe you have a comment. It would be great to hear from you. I actually think that uh, artists were implanted in production plants in the uh, 1920s and it was quite successful. And I generally believe that an artist must have the right to stay an artist and do his thing. He doesn't have to inflict good on the society by solving you know, problems that are blunt. I also wanted to mention here, I mean, you had this question, Dasha, about how come we are not working with the, the scientific community in our activation program? Well, naturally, we are working with them to a certain degree. But when you were talking about your expedition, I also realized that uh, scientists, they really stick to this distinction between an object and the subject. They cannot be as involved. Is it scientists or artists? Sounds like she means artists, actually. So I was able to explain to myself why we wanted to work so much with the community. We wanted to ensure we have a lot of engagement. We wanted to transition from observation, from scientific observation. We wanted to transition to action and active care. That's why we found it very important to bring in the people who are doing it practically. That's it for me. Urish, have you got anything? Um, thank you, but at this point, um, uh, too much to actually start. And I, I would, I, uh, this is the bad thing about being remote. Now it would be great to go um, have a drink and have a discussion <laughs> continued um, person to person without the pressure of being on the stage actually. And and, I, and this is one of the, the, the worst things about not being able to travel through, during COVID times. Uh, and, yeah, and, and I thought, and I, and I yeah and I just don't know where to even start actually just to kind of go back and you know it's been a full day anyway so um... oh, I do hope we will be able to travel again soon uh, without those numerous controls certificates and what have you. I hope that this new pandemic era will be over. But I'm so delighted to have seen you and to have heard from you and have learned from you. I do hope that our collaboration will continue. I do hope there will be more joint projects. Yeah. And it's always a pleasure to see you. It is indeed very valuable. To have institutions like ours, and it's great that we have this split second understanding of what we do and of each other. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, hey, thank you, thank you just for having us, Daria, as, as well. It's it's such a pleasure, always. Really. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. We're also thanking uh, both our online audience and our very patient offline audience. And I'm also very grateful to our new home, the Tratikov Gallery, for this partnership, for this opportunity to run these great conferences here. We will improve the technological part of the conference for sure, I promise. And I hope we'll get to meet all our beloved colleagues very soon. Thank you very much, Alexei, Dasha, Urash. Have a great evening. Get a drink and uh, have a great end of the week.
Thank you. Cheers. That's the end of the transmission and of the conference.